All right, here we're going to do post license. We're on our, I believe, uh, fifth session. This one's going to deal with purchase agreements, commonly known as contracts. And the thing about contracts, the purchase agreements, is you've got to understand what each paragraph and each sentence in that paragraph means. Because if it's outside the contract, it doesn't exist. You get to closing, here's what we're going by. It's not going to be he said, she said. If it's not in the contract, spelled out as detailed as you can get it, then it's who, who said you were going to do this? Well, you were supposed to uh, replace the roof. Well, you just repaired the roof. Well, the, the contract said you had to replace the roof. Well, you said you were going to, you, you said, no, what's the contract say? Mm -hmm. Everything goes back to the contract. When you have a dispute with someone in this business, first thing they're going to say is get the contract out. Mm -hmm. Look at the contract. What did it say? So that's what we're going to work on tonight is the contract part of this business. Y'all got all, everything else already up here now. You know why agency, we're going to review that. But tonight is contracts, how to write them, uh, how to make them clear. In World War II, General MacArthur said he didn't want messages that can be understood. He wants messages that cannot be misunderstood. And that's what our contracts are. That's reducing everything to writing. We're on the same page. Remember our contract? We had the uh, mutual agreement. Well, this is what we have mutually agreed on. And this is how we're going to proceed from here. Our goals. We're going to be able to write. When we get through today, we're going to be able to write a clear contract. Now, are we going to use paper or electronic? That's up to you. Depends on how you get the contract. Uh, I'm going to say half of them we get now are in DocuSign. It comes in, you open it, and it's got highlighted spots. I don't like that because oh, all I really have to do is find the, the, the yellow highlights and click and we're done. Well, not necessarily. Sometimes um, companies will have their own contract and you've got to stop and read every sentence and every paragraph. What did they change? Why did they not want to use the approved contract. So it's going to be up to you whether you decide to use paper or DocuSign. It's uh, kind of up in the air now, but five years from now there probably won't be any more paper contracts. It's sweeping that fast. Y'all remember net sheets, closing statements, estimated cost? Uh, well, we're going to do one of those along with our contract because we're going to write a contract and we're going to do all the things that we've got to do to make this contract uh, valid. And we've got to talk about lenders because uh, it, it just bottom line, folks, if you cannot get them approved, the sale's not going to happen. That's actually where you need to start. We're going to kind of jump over that and come back to it uh, later on, but I'm going to tell you right now, don't even go meet them at a house if they don't have at least a pre-approval pre-qualified. Some people use those interchangeably. Um, if they're not qualified, they don't, well, I don't know what I can buy. Well, then let's don't waste our time because they're ready to just jump in the car and say, oh, here's the one for me. Well, well baby, it's only 300000 Well, we only make $1,000 a week. Can they buy that house? Probably not. They, you need to get them to a lender and say, all right, lender, here are my numbers. What can I do? Uh, just the outline of everything we're going to do. We're going to break the outline down here as we move on through this, but uh, we're going to prepare. What have we got to do? What kind of stuff have we got to gather together before we even start writing the contract? Sometimes the other agents do this business I'm guilty of it, everybody's guilty of it, not answering your phone. Oh, well, I want to see a house you've got listed. Well, if you can't get a hold of the agent, 
there's a broker number on that uh, MLS listing as well. Call the broker. I say, I can't get a hold of them. I guarantee you within just a couple of minutes, you'll be getting a phone call. So don't be you know, worried about, well, I don't want to go around and make them mad at me. No, because people are going to do it to you too. You know, you got, we're all busy. we got lives and we got other things going on. And some people just got a short little attention span, short little fuse. And if you don't answer them immediately, they go ballistic. So just be aware of those folks. So if you can't, you can't work with them, work around them. Well, where we get all this information too? Uh, if somebody wants you to write an offer for them, where do you where do you start? Well, we're going to talk about that. How do we do comparables? We did on uh, um, well, what was it about two weeks ago? We did pricing property. Well, that's kind of where you need to start. What should I even offer for this property? Some people want to come in. They right now we're in a seller's market. Remember, there's not enough property on the market right now to meet demand. So the sellers have the upper hand. Uh, it's kind of funny, uh, we, we put a property on the market last week for 170. Next day I got an offer on it for 151. That's not a real offer in this market. That, that, the, the seller said, no. That's all he said, no. Now you've got to go back to the other agent and say, well, give us a realistic offer. You do know this is a seller's market. That house is probably going to sell really close to 170. But you'd be surprised how many people just throw a low ball offer out to you and think, oh, well, they'll take it. They've got to take it. They've got these issues they're going to have to. Uh, no. So we're going to look at price and property a little too. Alright, uh, who are you working for? When we get in this contract, you're going to find out that's the very first thing in the contract. Who are you working for? Whom, who's working for whom? Uh, we're going to gather up all our stuff, what has sold, uh, everything that we can gather up. To, the more information you have, the better prepared you are to defend your price. Uh, contingencies. Um, Electronic, we just talked about electronic. I know we talked about the lender a little bit already. What they've got to do, how we've got to work with them. Oh, REOs, that means real estate owned, that's bank owned property, and foreclosures. Um, there used to be, it was pretty simple. Pretty much everything went through one database. And you could jump in there and get it. But now there's a, at least a half a dozen that I know of auction sites. And they've all got their own rules. Even now with, with HUD on properties, depends on which uh, office you're working with. Here we've got Nashville or Atlanta. They've got different rules they play by. So you've got to get in there and think, oh, well, what do they want from you? Because they've got real tight little timelines. And if you don't have your paperwork done in order by time, they'll just throw you away and move on to the next one. Uh, they, they got plenty of offers. They don't need your offer. They got plenty of them. Short sale, nothing short about a short sale ex except tempers. Uh, it's, you're dealing with someone who is uh, in trouble financially. They really don't want to deal. They, don't, they just rather just put their head down and I hope all this goes away pretty soon. They still are calling the shots, but they're having to work through their lender who's got to approve the short sale. It's, um, it's pretty involved with a short sale. Get with your broker on that. Alright, here we are in our outline. Prepare our, our sales agreement. We've done a listing agreement. We've done a buyer's agency agreement. Now, we're going to do the buyer agency agreement again because that's one of the first things we should do when we start working with somebody is establish agency with them. They need our advice. They don't know it a lot of times, but they, they really do need to listen to us. We, we, this is what we do. You're going to call the other agent. Well, now I shouldn't say call the other agent. You, don't, you, you, you go through showing time to set up pretty much everything now. There's a little button on the MLS that says showing time. You click on it, brings up a calendar, and you say, okay, uh, tomorrow at 2. Click, 
and it'll give you a message, you'll get a confirmation. And then sometimes immediately, sometimes it may be an hour or the next day. Uh, but you'll get a confirmation from that other agent. Yeah, go show. Here's instructions. There's a cat or uh, don't do this. Turn off the lights. Some of them just got little details. They want to, and this is something people have quit doing is leaving cards when you show a listing. When you go in someone's property, you leave one of your business cards on the kitchen counter. That's kind of the commonplace put, to put it. On the back of it, write when you were there. Uh, Tuesday at 2 and leave it there because if there's three more people that come in that property and then now something's happened to something in the property well I was here there were three more people here after me they didn't report anything wrong mm -hmm. so cover your assets don't don't you know don't don't get in trouble in this business it's so easy so easy uh, you're going to start gathering up information. When was this house built? Remember our lead-based paint date? Remember when that was? 78. 78. Well, if you know this house is built in 55, mm -hmm. I need to be dealing with lead-based paint disclosures. Um, we're going to get into a, a printout on an MLS sheet and the information that we can get off there. We're going to look at tax records where we get information from there. And we'll pull all this together along with the comparables that we've looked up, what has sold, what has not sold. Um, those two give you kind of upper and lower limits. If it didn't sell, that price was probably do I? If it did sell, that's, that's an exact number that the appraiser is going to use. That's really kind of where you need to be because if you uh, get a contract on it that's you know, way above just because they didn't have an agent that helped them do the contract, then it's not going to appraise for that. And if it doesn't appraise for that, what are they going to do? We're going to talk about appraisals and how you can talk with the appraiser and um, before. You don't wait till after you get the price on. So, well, didn't you look at this one over here? No, there's a, what's called an appraisal package. You can send this along with the appraiser. Here's what we used as comparables. This one was two doors away, sold one month ago. It's exactly like this house. You want to make sure they get that one in the appraisal because he may miss that one for some reason. You know, he's doing two, maybe three a day. Yeah, pretty busy. I would bet it probably takes at least six hours to do an appraisal. Mm -hmm. So they may miss things, but once they have made their decision and they said, here it is, it's tough to get them to say, oh, well, I guess I was wrong about that. Mm -hmm. Uh-uh. No, address it uh, beforehand. Does the, the blender Oh my goodness, just, just don't even go out and deal with people unless they have at least talked to a lender and the lender said, well, uh, they can go up to 175. Uh, well, you don't need to be showing them 250 houses because they're going to see the 250 houses and then when they finally do settle down to the 175s, what's, what, what, they're going to be disappointed. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be happy with any of these 175s. So don't show them something they can't afford. You know, drive, take them over to the Mercedes store first, and then take them over to the cattle. I mean, to the uh, Chevrolet dealer. <laughs> no, take them to the Chevrolet dealer first. And if something changes like that, win the lotto, then we can upgrade. <laughs> We're gonna gather all our forms. We we've, we've got all this in your package right now. All right, first thing. Remember, first thing was to talk to the lender. So let's just assume they've already talked to the lender and um, they're ready to go. We did this the other night. Remember this? On our pricing property. This was where uh, this property sold. Um, was it uh, not long ago? They bought it for $250, this top property. There were two others right within a block of it that are kind of like it that make really good comparables. They have already been rehabbed. This one sold for 300 and this one sold for 360 All right, The one we're dealing with, they paid 250 for it, and they put 
$50,000 worth of improvements in it. I mean, you, can, you think maybe they want to get a profit? Mm -hmm. You think they're just going to sell it for three hundred dollars now? Mm -hmm. No, yeah. not likely. Uh, <coughs> but you have a buyer that likes this house. They saw it on Zillow. They looked, they had 50 pictures where all the upgrades are all shiny and you got granite and the, the hardwoods have been refinished and we got neutral colors and the new the fancy fixtures in the kitchen and stainless steel package with the gas um, yeah gas range oh yeah this is the one I want it's beautiful so they picked out the one they want let's just make another assumption that we have decided this is the one we're going to make an offer on so what do you think we should do first Gather yeah, some more information mm -hmm. about this house. Well, how big is it? Right there, all we know right now is it's uh, it's uh, two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Now I did come back in here and put the square footage. Mm -hmm. um, I put the square footage in here, and then how much it sold for per square foot. Mm -hmm. These bottom two, after they were rehabbed, sold at two hundred seventeen dollars per square foot. The bottom one sold for $205 a square foot. Mm -hmm. So you think this one after it's rehabbed is going to be worth at least $205 yeah. a foot? Mm -hmm. Maybe more than $217 depends on their taste. Mm -hmm. Some people do a really good job on rehab. Some just come in and do a surface. Mm -hmm. They really don't. It looks nice, but they really didn't changed the HVAC, they got the old water heater in, they left the old roof on. Yeah, yeah they, they, didn't, they didn't do it right. But I'm going to guess this one, let's just say, was done right. So we're going to have at least $205 per square foot as our uh, value. Mm -hmm. So let's look it up. Here it was when it was put on the market. This gives us, this is the last MLS when it was uh, listed. And the flipper bought it. I had it listed at two ninety nine, which to me sounds like that's an after rehab price based on what the others have sold. Mm -hmm. So it it didn't sell for that. That's and to jump to the next page. It was on it was only on the market for a month, but the flipper bought it. But this gives us a lot of information that we're going to need for our contract. There's our parcel ID. Remember a, a street address is not enough. Mm -hmm. The title company needs something more. There may be two with that same address. Mm -hmm. So if you can give them this parcel, there's also the legal description. Mm -hmm. We've got that. We've got a place for that on the contract as well. Give the title company something more than just the street address. You've also got things like here's our square footage. This is what the MLS says, and they have to get their information from either the tax records, a builder's plan. Uh, the owner now can say, yes, I measured it, and here's what it is. We're not allowed to measure. In fact, don't you ever measure. You, you, you need to put that monkey on somebody else's back. The reason we don't, we've just gone back to square footage. We didn't have square footage available to us I'm going to say eight years ago, it was a secret. Somebody said, how big is it? It's big. It's a big house. Well, it's because some agent somewhere got their tape measure out and measured this house and said, oh yeah, it's 2,000 square feet. And come to find out when it was actually measured, it's like 1,550 square feet. Who did they come after? The agent, because the agent took that monkey and put it on their back and said, oh yeah, I measured it myself. I know it's right. Mm -hmm. Well, they didn't know things like, well, you can't include the garage, mm -hmm. other non-livable area. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you added a sun porch on, but really all you did was screen it in, and uh, that's really not square footage now. Mm -hmm. So that's something that is really important I like to price property kind of on the square footage method because if you can get like properties in the same area, 
shouldn't they be worth about the same per square foot? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's an important number for us. Other important things on here, school systems. That won't be in our contract, but your buyer said, I want my kids to go to this school system. 95% of the kids that graduate from this uh, high school go to college. Okay, well, you got it better because everybody wants the kids to do better. A lot, I'm going to say a lot, most of the house buying and leasing decisions are made based on the school system. Mm -hmm. They want their kids, they will, they will eat, what is it, Romian noodles and, and, and instant coffee just to keep their kids in the school. I've seen it. Now you've got a lot of other things down through here that you might have missed when you just looked at the pictures. But it'll tell you. It's got a linen closet, tub shower combo, smooth ceilings. Uh, well, smooth ceilings, uh, these are smooth in here, but there was a period people liked that popcorn stuff. Mm -hmm. They don't like that anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, you looked at the pictures and you said, oh, I didn't notice that. It's got popcorn ceilings in it. Oh, this one doesn't. This one's got smooth ceilings, but mm -hmm. that's the kind of stuff that this information will give you more mm -hmm. to base your decision. Remember our material facts. Mm -hmm. Ceilings, probably not a material fact. School system, yes. Mm -hmm. That's a material fact. Even if it's not for you right now going in buying this deal, it's going to be a material fact when you get ready to sell it. So, those, this, we're just getting a lot of good information here. Looks like this property is a, all everything's on level one. So it looks like it may have the way it's sloped there. You may have a garage coming in over here. Can't tell it from that picture, but um, it, it'll tell us uh, right in here. Garage parking has got. Um, I don't see any. Mm -hmm. Doesn't say anything about it, but then here we got driveway parking and parking main level. Alright, so maybe we could pull our pictures up and look at that a little more. A lot of the houses in this area have full basements. Here's the, the next page. It gives you a, a map where it is. Uh, you can find it. Okay, that's great. Used to you had to give uh, really good directions on how to get to a property. Mm -hmm. Spell it out for them. You turn at this drug store and you go two blocks and you turn left on so-and-so street. Who does that anymore? Mm -hmm. Now you've got the address, you punch the address in your GPS and hit the go button mm -hmm. and it says continue on Highway 31 mm -hmm. and it'll, it'll bring you right to the door. I, I wouldn't want to be in the map making business. Oh, <laughs> oh sad for them. Uh, but more information here. We've got some things that are important in our contract. We've got condo fees, association fees, that's our homeowner's association. Uh, who manages the association? You, you, um, the, um, the closing attorney or the title agent is going to call them to make sure if there's an HOA association that you have been paying your HOA fees. Remember that is a lien. And the property is not going to change hands <clears throat> until that's cleared off. This being in the city, you won't have garbage fees or library fees or fire fees, but you don't know that just because where it is on the map. Because a lot of these cities, they, they came to be, and then as they grew, the new people didn't want to be in the city. They wanted to be in the county because they wouldn't have the extra taxes. Mm -hmm. So you've got to look at that stuff and say, okay, wow, it's got a, what's that, a fire fee? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a pretty good indication that it's not in the city. It's in a, um, an unincorporated, or it could be incorporated, but it's not covered by the, the city's uh, taxes to do your fire. Uh-oh, this says property being sold as is, do not walk on the deck. Mm -hmm. All right, well, this is when it sold last time, when the flipper got it. The flipper probably used that as uh, what we would call ammunition. Leverage. Yeah, leverage, <laughs> ammunition. 
to say, okay, the deck's in awful condition. How about the roof and the soffits and the found? They're just going to keep piling on you. Well, I found this was bad. Now look at these other things I found. I bet when they did the inspection on this house, the list was that long. Oh, these are just all really, really bad things. It's going to cost so much money to fix. And they just kept beating that cellar down. And where this house is, um, let's see, this is the new owners here, but um, where it is in this area, uh, some of these people may be the original owners. This was built in 55 could be someone bought that house new in 1955 mm -hmm. and now they haven't done any upgrades any improvements still got shag carpet in the mm -hmm. living room well nobody ever walks on we, we don't ever go in we don't we don't let the kids go in here either they may spill something on this well those are gonna knock that price down to allow this flipper to do better all right, so we've got that information. Here's um, when you're contacting an agent, here's how you contact them, their information. And then when properties sell, just because it says 289 here, then it, yeah, 2888, I think that says, um, that doesn't mean that's what it sold for. That was its listing price. Here's what it sold for, 250. So when you're looking at these, don't just say, okay, that one was 289. No, that doesn't mean it sold for that. You got to dig a little deeper. Here's what it sold for. It sold for $134 a square foot. The flipper should make money on this one because we've already decided back up here that they're going to have $300,000 in it. Now, just with what we've just seen here, we decided it would be at least $200 a square foot. That's kind of, that's our floor. As we get into um, negotiating next week, that's called our BATNA. That's our, our, that's our walk away price. Here's, here's what's going to happen if we can't get at least $200 for it. We'll just sit on it a minute because we know two others very recently have paid more than that to be in this neighborhood. So we don't have to go below this. Mm -hmm. Although the, the seller doesn't have to go below this. Right. So they're thinking $370,000 is probably the sales price on this property. Would y'all think that would be a good one? Mm -hmm. Well, the most expensive one sold for three hundred sixty. But 1,750 square feet versus 1,850 square feet. That's another 100 square feet. That has value. According to this, that's worth $20,000 just for that extra 100 square feet in this neighborhood. Well, your buyer wants this neighborhood. How many are actually on the market in this neighborhood, of specifically this school zone, that we can live with. We don't want to have to go in here and sand the floors. We just want to bring our suitcases in. The moving van, they'll pull up and start unloading. We don't want to have to think about anything. We want to just move in. So that's the kind of house they're going to be looking for. Kind of got that? All right. That gave us a lot of information. Now here's where we're going to get some more information. This is the tax. You can, whoop. on here you can go, um, I don't see the button on here, but there's, there's a tax button that you can click and it'll bring this up for you. This will tell you when it sold last, how much it sold for, uh, when it sold prior to that in 2006, it sold for 234000 well, that tells me it's not the original owners in there, but these people that bought it in 2006 may have bought it as is, hadn't been updated. Um, they just wanted to get their kids into that school system. And that was the cheapest thing they could find. So they took it. 2006, now we, 15 years later, their kids 
certainly by now have graduated from that school. 15, you shouldn't take 15 years to work through that school system. But I'm guessing that may be who bought it, somebody for the school. This also takes us back through taxes. How much is the tax on this? Because this is something that uh, is going to be part of their mortgage payment now. This house was uh, assessed. Remember, assessed is what the tax appraiser thinks it's worth based on bulk assessing. He thinks it's worth two hundred fifty-four thousand, and he's got it uh, assessed uh, taxable value at ten percent of that. So that tells you the people that were here had it homesteaded. So if the person that's buying this house is going to turn it into a rental, they'll need to know well my taxes are probably going to double, will double, maybe more because this is eighteen taxes went up last year, uh, eight eight and a half percent. I'm pretty sure they're probably going to do that again. They're, they're probably not going to because prices are going up now. So next year, the taxes just to homestead here may be, um, I don't know, $100, $200 more. So if we're buying this as an investment property, we need to know that we're going to have maybe $5,000 worth of property taxes on it. We need to think about that when we're doing our return on investment calculations. Okay, and more tells you, uh, here we go, it was built in 1954. One of the first things we need to get in our little package is a lead-based paint form. Sometimes you will have um, this D, this document, you can click on it and it will open up and you'll have the lead-based paint. You'll have other documents that they want you to have. There may be a, a survey on there for you. Uh, could be the homeowners association rules and regulations, the CCNRs. That's where you'll find that kind of information. The history button will be every. Whoops. The history button will be kind of like this, except it'll have where it sold last. That will be longer. It'll bring up your history, when it was put on the market, how much, when they dropped it. It'll tell you you know pretty much everything you need to know about what's been going on with this house mm -hmm. you see one time it was on the market for uh, 300 days before they finally canceled it I mean, you gotta wonder why mm -hmm. what do y'all think it was price. price of course that's the first thing you should think <laughs> price it's been on the market for three months it's price in this market it shouldn't be on the market for over a week before you get your first offer Okay, we got all these other things. Um, it's got a fireplace, yes. Uh, down here, this is something that's important nowadays. Going to be more important during your careers. Is it in a floodplain? And we looked up a floodplain one night, mm -hmm. and you know, right around here, we're kind of a little high spot here, but you don't have to get too far away from here, and you're in a low spot. Mm -hmm. You're near the Cahaba River or one of the the feeder branches into it, that floods. Remember the cars floating floating around on Highway 31 here a couple of years ago. That's more important now. This one has got an X. That means it's outside a flood zone. So you, you don't have to worry about that too much. But if it's in a flood zone or up near a flood zone, well, if it's near a flood zone now, chances are it's going to be in a flood zone not long from now so keep that in mind when you when you because you're advising <laughs> remember you, you agency with them we haven't done that for them yet but we're headed there mm -hmm. all right so we got a lot of information now this is where we actually search for the information so on the mls we did sold and we were just looking for single family homes and um we did a radius map we put the address in and went out to maybe a half a mile. Probably didn't need to go a half a mile there. A third of a mile might have been okay, but a half a mile is a good, good radius for you. And once you have those three pieces of information, you hit search. Oh, we did um, status too. You don't want to go back over a year. 
you got a piece of property with, that sold in 2006, that number doesn't mean a thing now. Mm -hmm. No, nothing. So that gave us this um, other search right here. This is everything that sold. It says there's 20 properties that sold in that little box that we just built. We can go down through here and say, okay, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. The best, ooh, there's one right there on the same street, real near it. Sold for 360. Well, that's one we already had in our little list. So we're pretty comfortable with these bigger numbers. And here, here there's, I brought that back up. Uh, these are the ones that are active right now. So remember, we, we just got our souls. That gives us, here's what someone wrote a check for. Mm -hmm. Active is the seller's pie in the sky number. It's not going to sell for more than this. Um, and it's funny, all sellers, shouldn't say all, I'm going to say most sellers, when you tell them, all right, this property is going to sell for, we decided this one was going to sell for 370. Mm -hmm. That's a kind of our walk away. We're not, we're not taking anything less than that. If it's going to sell for 370, what do you think they're going to want to price it? Come on, y'all. Ten weeks into this. 369. Yeah. That, that's acceptable. If you're in a good market, tight market, and you've got yours priced correctly, 369 would probably be a really good list price for it. What do you think the seller's going to want you to put it for? 379. 379, 389. Then why don't we just go to 399 and see yeah. what happens? That's what they do. Let's just see what happens. I don't care how much time you got to put in it or how many times you got to show it. See if you can get 399. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a saying in investments, the bigger fool theory. That's what investments are based on, the bigger fool theory. There's somebody more foolish than me that's going to pay more. So let's let's just throw, throw our line out there and put some pretty bait on it and just see if we catch one. And then they'll come back and they'll say, well, if it hasn't sold at $3.99 in a month, uh, let's, let's lower it. Mm -hmm. well, what would you like me to lower it to? Well, $3.98. <laughs> this is where we got to get into our counseling session. <laughs> because the longer it stays on the market, the lower it's going to sell for. People are going to say, what's wrong with it? Mm -hmm. Especially one that goes under contract a couple of times mm -hmm. and then falls off. What happened? Their first thought is the inspection came back. Mm -hmm. Not only was the, they didn't replace their deck. So here are our pie in the sky numbers uh, for three properties. Uh, I don't know how far away from those that one is, but. Um, don't have the square footage here either, but 324, 344, and 369. This is your competition. Because when you put yours on the market, and what we say we're going to do, 369, and don't leave off that 9. <laughs> Not just 369, but 369, 9. That's another $1,000 of the seller's money. That could be what makes it, because once you get into the the negotiations, sometimes it'll be a thousand dollars that'll kill the deal. <laughs> so we've got these actives, that's our competition, and they've been on the market, ooh, 168, 131, 38 days. Okay, all built uh, about that same, well that was a little newer. This one 1978, we don't need a lead-based paint on this one, because it was built in 78. Mm -hmm. Unless it was built January the first before midnight. <laughs> okay, I told you we are going to talk about the lender. There are lots and lots of places for your customer who is now your client. Well, not yet because we haven't done that form. But um, first thing you need to ask somebody is, are you working with another agent? Mm -hmm. That's the first thing you need to ask them because if they're working with another agent, 
you need to just kind of back off and let let them work with their agent their agent may not be giving them the service they want and they called you or your sign was in the yard and somebody called you off your sign so I'm calling you back to Vestview Lane okay are you working with an agent yes I am okay I'll give you the basics on it it's this much and this many bedrooms this big uh, but have your agent call me and set up an appointment well I can't get a hold of them eh, well we got more problems here uh, but as long as they've got an agency relationship with someone else you need to stay out of it mm -hmm. that they will actually take your license if you try to get in there and push that other agent out of the way to substitute a contract that you benefit from remember that free license mm -hmm. that was a test question so, next question you're going to ask them is what? Have you talked to a lender? Well, there are plenty of lenders out there. The internet now, um, you don't even have to go to Wells Fargo. You just go on their website, sign on and apply. Oh, and you've got, that's me. Click. <laughs> and it'll take you to a form that you'll start filling out right there online. And they'll tell you pretty much on what you told them here's kind of what you can buy more than likely they're gonna somewhere down here they're gonna get your email and your phone number and then they're gonna call you and ask you some more questions because they're trying to nail you down as a customer for them mm -hmm. but Wells Fargo um, on our website we've got a couple of links to mortgage companies that we work with um, yeah, that's the mortgage companies when y'all get your license you're gonna find out they want to do business with you they want to they want to have uh, this is uh, with Wells Fargo but there are lots of them they're gonna when you get your license they're gonna start contacting you they'll send you emails hey how can we help you here's our special deal uh, they want you to refer business to them that's how they get business they don't just call people out of the blue and say, hey, do you want a mortgage? No, they've got to work through people that know who needs a mortgage. So, just the internet. Uh, you got them, you've got, uh, let's say, why are they, oh, pre-approval, pre-qualified. If they're not qualified, you don't need to be dealing with them. Mm -hmm. they, you know, they, they filed bankruptcy last year well it's going to be another year at least before they can do anything well my credit score is 650 well they they got they're going to have a problem we're going to look at that in a minute but they're going to have a problem getting a mortgage at 650. Mm -hmm. you probably need to be dealing with a mortgage company that will help them mm -hmm. help them fix their credit mm -hmm. these guys these mortgage companies know what you need to do to get your credit up you really need to get it up to around 720 mm -hmm. to get a good rate but knowing how much you can borrow before you get to this contract and we start writing all right well here's here's what we're offering but you know we're gonna have to have a an FHA loan because uh, we won't have any money to put down you know, there's, there's a little red flag right there mm -hmm. uh, they're probably gonna want you to pay their closing cost and maybe pay something to this maybe the seller hold a second mortgage uh, little things will pop up but you need to know where they are before you start working with them so we're ready to go with our contract we have mr. good credit that's a good person to have mr. good credit <laughs> qualified for a conventional mortgage loan for three hundred and fifty thousand dollars based on our preliminary review of the information provided you are always going to qualify this does not guarantee they're going to be approved but just what they told us over the phone or filled out on the application we think they can qualify just right off for a three hundred fifty thousand dollar conventional loan mm -hmm. so if they can qualify for that what can is that is that where we should be looking at three hundred fifty thousand dollar houses because this is conventional we probably need to be looking somewhere around four because they're going to put 20 percent down 
to get down and then that'll be their loan amount. Mm -hmm. So Mr. Good Credit, not only he's got good credit, but he's got some cash. Maybe forty, fifty thousand dollars. He may have a hundred thousand in cash. Mm -hmm. You don't know these things. Yeah. The mortgage company is not going to share that kind of private, confidential information with you. This is what they're going to give you. They're qualified for this. Now, this is a little game they play too. Mm -hmm. They, they, the Mr. Good Credit went to the the mortgage company and said, "Well." Uh, I know I can qualify for a half a million dollar loan, but I don't want the seller to know that. Mm -hmm. Here's where I'm looking that I want to end up. So you know I can qualify for a $500,000 loan, but I want you to write the letter saying that I'll qualify for three fifty. dollars It's just a little game they play. Mm -hmm. But they're not going the other way. He qualifies for a $200,000 loan, no, uh, Wells Fargo is not going to write this letter saying they're qualified for three hundred and fifty. Mm -hmm. mm. Buyer consultation. All right, we've uh, talked to them on the phone. They called you off. Let's just say they called you off the sign and said, "I'm interested in your listing there on Vestibule Lane. Can you tell me more about it?" And your first question was, "Are you working with an agent?" And they said, no, we just started looking. Have you talked to a lender? Yes, we're one of, um, we're, we're, we got an account at Wells Fargo, so we just started there. And they, uh, they said, yeah, we could go up to 350 on a conventional loan. Mm -hmm. And you say, yes, mm -hmm. yes, got somebody qualified for 350. Mm -hmm. So what should you do next? Our consultation is where we're going. We got the two important questions answered. They're not working with anybody else, mm -hmm. and they already talked to a lender. Mm -hmm. So now, we don't know what their level of expertise is on buying a house. Mm -hmm. All we know is they've called us about one that we have listed. Mm -hmm. So our buyer consultation, uh, got a link to it here, but I printed it out. These are the things that we need to bring them into the office sit them down two reasons here i'm going to go to the first one your safety mm -hmm. real estate agents are really vulnerable to being robbed and kidnapped and worse so if you just go meet somebody at a property you've got a higher chance of something bad happening to you but if you will bring them into the office mm -hmm. sit them down at the conference table and say there's some things we'd like to go over. First thing, home inspection. Ask them, have you ever had a home inspection before? And they say, no, this is, uh, this is uh, we haven't bought a house in 20 years. Uh, but no, they weren't doing them 20 years ago. <laughs> so you need to explain to them what a home inspection is, what it covers, what it doesn't cover. They, they've never had one. They don't know. Mm -hmm. How about home warranty? Well, isn't that the same as a home inspection? Mm -hmm. No. Uh, they, they probably if they bought theirs 20 years ago. They don't know what a home warranty is. So we need to talk about a home warranty, what it covers, what it doesn't cover. Mm -hmm. Con uh, contract deadlines. Our new contract has time of the essence written into it. Mm -hmm. That means that uh, time is carved in stone. If you miss a date, a deadline, you've, you've lost the rights to come back and claim that. As is, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. We're in working order? Well, one of the eyes on the stove doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Does that mean the stove is not in working order? No, no, not necessarily. Three of them work just fine. The oven works just fine. you got one eye that doesn't work. You know they sell those at Walmart? You can buy a new one for about $10. Take this one out that doesn't work, slide another one in, and now it's in working order. That's something you should have gone over with your seller. 
before they did the home inspection and the home inspector said the front left eye doesn't work <laughs> and now you're saying oh no what else doesn't work mm. so you want to cover all this stuff in this buyer consultation more stuff final walkthrough well in your home inspection you got it back the inspector said the right front eye doesn't work mm. so when you sent the summary to the seller saying hey we'd like for these things to be fixed for us to move forward with this contract mm -hmm. and one of them is going to be the eye front left eye on the stove mm -hmm. replace it mm -hmm. they may say replace the stove mm -hmm. well then we're going to get back in negotiating mode and say we will repair that stove mm -hmm. but chances are this house that we're dealing with has all new appliances in it but if it was a, a just a regular sale that would be something that you would check on your final walkthrough on your way to closing you're going to go to the house and say okay let's just check and make sure it's just like it was when we bought it okay oh the eye works now oh that's so much better check that off the list you're checking for the things you told or asked them to do professional vendors um, we don't guarantee any of these folks we've already talked about mortgage brokers mm -hmm. we may refer you to a mortgage broker mm -hmm. we may refer you to a home inspector title companies mm -hmm. we don't we don't have a dog in that fight we're not getting cut back kickbacks rebates that's not allowed we're doing it just because we know this inspector he's done a hundred inspections for us he, he's really good on the days he show, shows up sober uh oh <laughs> well <laughs> today may not have been his day <laughs> so you're not guaranteeing them you're just saying we've used them they did good work for us but don't ever say oh they'll always do the perfect job mold uh oh 20 years ago when one of these people bought their last house mold was called mildew mm -hmm. Everybody, I smell that it smells like mildew well just get some Clorox and wipe it down everything's good well now it may not be Chinese drywall more of that Megan's law remember we're, we're none of these are we responsible for discovering mm -hmm. if it's there uh, mole the inspector may find it or when you walked in you may have said that smells like mole I've got an allergy to mole my head's gonna swell up if we stay in here any longer uh oh well you did you've been in there ten times and you never smelled it it may just be mildew because it's been closed up for two months and the air the utilities were turned off and not getting circulation so it may just be mildew but you need to talk to your buyer at the consultation here's some of the things we may have to deal with and here's how we deal with them wood infestation that's a report that the termite guy will do the mortgage company may require it survey very rarely do they require a survey but the title search that's one of the things that the title company is not looking at they don't go to the property and see the neighbor's garage is built on your property mm -hmm. so if you're showing this property and you see something new a new fence mm -hmm. a new garage in your neighbor's house you see those kind of things you may want a survey square footage we talked about that already uh, there are sources to get it sewer and septic tank do they know what the difference in a sewer and a septic tank is these are things you're talking to your buyer about that are important mm -hmm. if it's got a septic tank one of the things that I'm going to write in the contract is septic system must be inspected and cleaned mm -hmm. that's going to cost the seller three hundred fifty four hundred dollars to have that done mm -hmm. but we're not going to move forward until that is done mm -hmm. you don't know how many families have lived in this house how many kids how many people lived in here mm -hmm. for the last 20 years and they've never cleaned it out in 20 years mm -hmm. 
whoa, <laughs> this thing, whoa, I absolutely want it checked. Mm -hmm. Varmint infestation. Varmints? Says rodents, reptiles, animals, insects, reptiles. We had a, a rental property out on this uh, by a lake and they were always having snakes. Mm -hmm. And they would get under this house. Mm -hmm. And one day the HVAC went over to do something out there and he told the tenant, there's snakes under the house. I bet they're in the walls too. Mm -hmm. Oh no! Caused us some issues. But if they're reptiles, animals, insects, you probably, someone needs to go ahead and get this taken care of before somebody finds it. Mm -hmm. Stigmatized properties, um, we've talked about those in pre-license. Alabama does not have a law addressing stigmatized properties. Mm -hmm. But if it is, there was a murder-suicide here two years ago. Mm -hmm. The neighbors are going to tell your buyers, um, you want to talk to the seller about this up front, mm -hmm. saying this is probably a material issue to many people. We need to discuss this with them. They may say, no, don't talk about that. Mm -hmm. And if they tell you, no, don't talk about it, what are you going to do? No, I'm not talking about it. If they ask you a direct question, I heard there was a murder-suicide in here two years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't matter what the seller told you. Mm -hmm. You have been asked a direct question. Remember, that was one of our hard questions. Mm -hmm. You better say, yes, I heard that. Um hazard insurance. And we talked about home warranty. Well, isn't that the same thing as hazard insurance? Well, hazard insurance covers certain things and doesn't cover certain things. Mm -hmm. You need to discuss that with them because if you can't get hazard insurance on the property, you're not going to get a mortgage on it. Property taxes, we just talked about those as we're doing our research. Mm -hmm. uh, that is important in a lot of places. you got to pay them. Now, if it's got a mortgage on it, the mortgage company is going to pay it for the, the new buyer. But if not, they got to be paid. Other offers, I, you're sitting with your buyer. This is a really popular area, and this is a, the house, I believe, is priced correctly. There may be other people that are going to make an offer on this property. Okay? Talk to them. How do you want to deal with that? Do you have like a maximum you'll pay? You bought stuff on eBay? You can say, here's the maximum I'm going to pay. Mm -hmm. I will pay up to, on our property, it's uh, listed at uh, 369 This buyer really wants to be there. He said, I'd pay 380 for it. All right. Well, other offers, there are going to be other people that may drop offers on, on this seller. Right, well you can put along with your offer an escalation, uh, like on eBay. If there is another legitimate offer on this property, we will best it by $1,000. But we need to see that legitimate offer. You just can't say, yeah, we got one for $390 mm -hmm. or $380 or whatever. You, if you want it, it's going to be 1000 over. You cover yourself. but. You can do these kind of things. Most likely it's going to be everybody's going to throw an offer on the seller's table and the agent's going to come back and say, we have a multiple offer situation here. We would like for you to give us your highest and best. And then send it back to the offerors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, offerors. And they'll say, mm, nah, that's all we can do. Or, yeah, I'll go more. Let them know how it works. Earnest money, some of them don't understand. Well, I'm writing you an earnest money check for $1,000. Who gets this money? You don't want to say, well, it's going to be part of my commission. Mm -hmm. You say, no, it's going to be held in trust mm -hmm. in an escrow account until the sale closes, and then they'll show up as a credit for you. Mm -hmm. That's important. You need to cover these things before you go and to look at a property and they don't know what a flood zone is they don't know what they don't know what they don't know mm -hmm. it's your job as their agent and that's where we're going next 
Oh, that, well, it looks like we're going to seller disclosure next. There is no seller disclosure form in Alabama. Mm -hmm. The Real Estate Commission has one on their website if you want to use it. You can send it along with your offer and say, I want this filled out for this offer to be valid. The seller might say, no, I'm not filling it out. Then fine, the offer's not an offer. Because if they're wanting to hide all this stuff from you, because of the seller disclosure form, we had one in pre-license, it's pretty detailed. Mm -hmm. It gives you information to ask for more information. And Alabama, since it's a buyer beware state, mm -hmm. it's a good idea to, to ask some better questions. Mm -hmm. Remember our caveat mTOR, buyer beware. This is the buyer, unless the buyer knows of health and safety issues, they don't have to tell you anything else. Yeah, the roof's got a leak. Yeah, I know the roof's got a leak, but unless you find it, ha ha ha. <laughs> These are the things that you have to ask. Caveat in for it doesn't apply to these things. We know this is a pre-license. You've already been tested on this. Now you get out in the real world, you really get tested on it. Now say, tell me about the neighbors. No. <laughs> Don't know anything about the neighbors. <laughs> the property we're looking at is built in 1955. So we need to produce this. Hopefully the listing agent, well you're the listing agent, um, you got the seller to sign one of these. Mm -hmm. The seller's pretty much always going to say, no, I don't know anything about lead-based paint, I don't have any records of it. Mm -hmm. Then they've got 10 days to do their own lead-based paint analysis. You've also got to give them a pamphlet, lead and um, uh, protect your family from lead in your home. Mm -hmm. Got to give this to them. And they, you initially it, saying you talked to them about lead-based paint, they initially it, said, yeah, you gave me the pamphlet, gave me the form, everything's good, I know about lead-based paint. It's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. So if they've got small children, you really want to talk about this a little more, make sure they understand the risk. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got that far. Um, let's take a quick break here for about uh, five minutes. All right, back from our little quick break. You've got a new pack of papers there. Okay. That is the checklist. Because when you're dealing with somebody, you've got a lot of things you've got to do, some things you've got to have in the file, some things you get from other people. But as you work through it, this checklist, you can keep track of all of it. Uh, like the other agent. You won't have another agent on this one because you're the listing agent. <clears throat> but you've got to have things like the RECAD, mm -hmm. uh, the listening agreement, you had that, you're going to have in the file, buyer agency, we're going to do one of those. And we'll just walk down through here and make sure we got everything done. Down at the bottom, last thing is the closing statement. Mm -hmm. And then you turn that in with your package. Oops. Here's where you started. You brought them into the office, you did that buyer consultation and you say, I am a real estate agent. Alabama law requires me to give you this form. This is not a contract. This is just a disclosure statement to tell you that I have responsibilities and you have rights. Here they are. We are going to be working together either in two different ways. You have the listing on this property. So you have single agency with your seller client. Mm -hmm. Now, you've got the choice now, or actually the, the person that's sitting at the table with you, they're going to decide whether they want you to just fill out the paperwork for them. If so, you're going to stay as a transaction broker with them. It means you have no agency duties to them. Chances are they're going to say, well, you know, it's been 20 years since we bought a house. We really need some guidance on this. Mm -hmm. That's where you're going to go to limited consensual dual agent. Alabama's one of the few states you can do this. But here in your listing package, when you listed the house, you told the seller in your consultation with them, we may have the buyer. And if we do, 
well, maybe go to this dual agency. Are you comfortable with that? And you explain it to them how we keep the wall up. We don't tell either one of you anything that will hurt the other. So let's just say we're going to probably be dual agent with them. Okay. But you've given them the form and you had you explained it to them. They don't have to sign it. You have to sign it, date it. Uh, but since we're sitting there with them and this is the first time we've talked to them, it's not a good idea to shove this in front of them and say sign it. Mm -hmm. Before you really, they understand what it is. It's just an acknowledgement. What you're signing here is saying, I did tell you about this. Mm -hmm. This doesn't create any kind of contract with us. Mm -hmm. This one does. This is your next page. You got no, yeah, you got one right there. It's where you create agency with this um, sell, this buyer that you've got that called you off your sign. And you said, have you got an agent? They said, no. Come on in. You talk to a mortgage company. Oh, yeah, we got here's our letter. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're ready to go. All right, for me to represent you as your agent and give you the advice that you're asking me to give you, this is what we have to do. We have to create this form that gives me the right to advise you. That's what this is doing, giving you the right to advise your buyer. And they say, oh yeah, that's what I want. I want you to be able to tell me what we should offer. Tell me, tell me, tell me. Without this, you really can't tell them a whole lot. You can say, um, certain things but when it gets down to like advising them on price well you've got the listing on it you can't say well I know they will take yeah. this you've got this as this what you're doing is you're creating a, a level playing field you can show them all right here's what others have sold for around here just like this and the seller has uh, said that they think it should sell for or just you decided it was three sixty nine, okay, three sixty nine nine. Um, I can't advise you on that price. All I can do is show you here is what has sold, mm -hmm. and that's public record, so you can show them that. You can't show them things like, well, uh, they they're fixing to you know if they don't sell this this month, they're going to lose it to the bank. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of stuff you can't tell them. Okay. But this just outlines what you're going to do. Remember, this is just like a listing agreement. It's got to have who, what, when, where, and especially the time. Remember, we have to have a, a start and an ending date, no automatic renewals. This works just like the listing. So we're looking for a residential in this area. We're looking for this, that, when we want it all, price range. And then here, it's going to start today. And let's run it out for three months. If they haven't found a house in three months, they're not serious. So let's run it out for three months. And here's the conditions. Uh, inspections. We're going to kind of rehash some of the things we went over in the buyer consultation. In fact, we haven't done that yet because we're kind of starting here. Um, what we're going to do, and then here's our limited consensual dual agent. That's where we're actually having agency with both sides. Mm -hmm. This is the back page. Two pages to this agreement. This one's about compensation. That's the other thing that you're doing here. You're establishing an agency with them and how you're going to get paid. What you're going to get paid. Now, some agents, my wife is one that says, you should get 3% on everything. Well, maybe, maybe not. It's negotiating. There is no standard set agreement on price with anybody. Mm -hmm. That's just in her mind. Some others have that same thing. You're going to establish that right here. We're going to be purchasing. This is about options and that's about a lease, but we're in the first one here on purchase. Mm -hmm. um, you tell them, all right, as a professional agent advising you on what you need advice on, um, we want to be paid, let's just say, two and a half percent. Mm -hmm. 
three percent five percent whatever you think you can get and a lot of that's going to depend on the price of the house if you're talking about in this case a 300 plus thousand dollar house you may be happy with two percent two and a half somewhere in there you're happy with but what if it was a thirty thousand dollar house you want two percent on that no well there you might want to put a, a dollar amount I want a, a minimum of three thousand dollars you could say that here uh, three thousand or three percent depending on the price of the house is how that works uh, once you've established what you're gonna be paid on this deal whether they decide to call someone else's sign and buy from them you're still going to get paid because yours went through three more months mm -hmm. and as long as you are working with them and can not just drop the ball and just not call them for a month this will go away but if you're working with them and they buy from somebody else you're still going to get paid mm -hmm. right there you have to disclose any kind of affiliated business agreements you have with other companies here we don't have any we've got a mortgage company across the, the hall um, in this building we've got insurance uh, we've got title we've got closing services from people that we know but we don't get paid anything on any of that we're not allowed to get paid just as a referral but if it was a business arrangement mm -hmm. to where maybe we owned part of the mortgage company uh, then you've got to say okay we we're going to get paid if you use this mortgage company since we own part of it mm -hmm. we're going to get a we're going to get paid privacy you got to keep all of this kind of information confidential confidentiality goes on forever and uh, fresh corn we've dealt with that we don't discriminate against anyone for any reason. Mm -hmm. They sign it, you sign it, and it is a contract now, two-sided, bilateral, between your broker, even though you're the one that went out there and, and found these people, brought them in, had them sign everything, it's still between your broker mm -hmm. and this buyer. Mm -hmm. Just like the listing agreement was between your broker and the buyer mm -hmm. now let's review what's the first thing we must do as a license and we start working with the consumer ask them if they got an agent that's the first thing uh, what other questions should we ask yeah, have they spoken with the lender yes you are listening <laughs> yes uh, why do we need a buyer's agency agreement so, you <laughs> so we can get paid that's the bottom line so we can get paid that's that just cut it right down so I get paid as long as I'm doing my work that agreement says I'm going to be paid for it uh, one of the other things we've got to do is give them the recad form mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then when we get into the agency buyers agency we're also going to have to have that dual agency mm -hmm. because you have the listing as well now for the fun part got our contract we're ready to go they have um, um you did the buyer consultation you got the recap signed you got the buyer agency signed dual agency signed and they say we're ready to go look at the house we're tired of fooling with all this paperwork mm -hmm. well now we go look at the house you're protected mm -hmm. so you're going to have them meet you at the house Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you, don't ever put somebody in your car. Don't get in anybody's car. Okay. It's just too dangerous. Even if you got a gun, mm -hmm. they'll take it away from you and shoot you with it. So just don't, don't get yourself in that situation. Meet them at the house. Mm -hmm. You may have another house or two lined up as well, but we're just going to deal with our one. Mm -hmm. Meet them at the house they get there you get there y'all walk through it you spend an hour picking this thing apart oh I really like the granite they did in here I wish they had used a different color mm -hmm. but then they say we can live with it okay 
<laughs> we like this stainless steel package. There are no, there are no blinds up. You think the seller put up some blinds? Mm -hmm. Don't know. Mm -hmm. You don't know. Yeah. When push comes to shove, the seller may come in there himself with blinds and put them up to make this deal work. Mm -hmm. You don't know yet, but they're, they're get, that was actually a buying signal. Do you think he would put up blinds? Mm -hmm. You should probably answer that with, if he did, would you want the house then? Mm -hmm. You do a little test close, kind of taking their temperature. Mm -hmm. They ask you something like that. Well, if that's important, is that something that uh, would be um, a material? I say, well, how would we phrase this? Um, if he put up lines, would you want the house then? Mm -hmm. To keep it simple. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a, yeah, and some other things, but that's okay. It doesn't matter. Uh, they're walking down a path with you now. Mm -hmm. You're getting little yeses. Mm -hmm. Yes, oh, I like the granite. Oh, yes, I love the stainless steel. Oh, it's a side-by-side. -side. Well, I've never had one with water in the... Okay, mm -hmm. good. <laughs> You're upgrading. Mm -hmm. So, here's where we're going to start. This is the first page. This has 11 pages to it. This just outlines what we're dealing with. We're going to have the address here, but we remember also that's not a significant uh, for the uh, surveyor to find it. Legal description, we had a little short one here, and we also had the parcel ID number. That was in the information we had. So we can put that. This is undersigned buyers. I never, ever write their names here. Okay. I have them write their names. Spell it. Print it in copy book, simple, clear letters, because the attorney is going to use whatever you wrote right here. Mm -hmm. And if he can't tell the difference between your E and a C, everything a stops, and we got to redo the paperwork. Mm -hmm. um, that may be. They may stop it because you may have a, a judgment against you under E. But they ran it under C. So now we got a bigger issue. So have them write their name here clearly. Copy book. Don't write it out in beautiful cursive. Mm -hmm. Copy book. That means how you wrote it in the fifth grade. Every letter is perfectly formed, easy to read. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the sellers. Um, you have them, when you send this to them, you say, print your name here as it is on the deed. Mm -hmm. You may have it on the deed, and you may fill this out in DocuSign. And if you've got the deed, and you know why their names are spelled, you can go ahead and put that in. Mm -hmm. But you don't know the buyers yet. Mm -hmm. This is today's date. This is when we started working on this. Mm -hmm. That's not going to be the finalized date. Finalized date's very bottom of page 11, where it says, we are all in agreement. Mm -hmm. This is when the clock starts on our inspections, uh, financing, any other thing that's got a timeline on it starts there, not here. Do we got that down? This used to be down on page two or three. Wasn't that important? But apparently uh, they had a change of heart. This is really important now because this is number one. First thing we're going to deal with who is working for whom? You put the listing company, which you're going to be the listing company, you put that there, and you are an agent of the seller, agent of the buyer, an agent of both seller and buyer, limited consensual dual agency, or transaction broker. All right, well, I've got both sides, so I'm going to have to click agent of both. both. You're going to have to do the same thing over here. You're the selling company, and you're going to be both. Had they said, no, I don't need you. If I just need for you to fill out the paperwork for me, then you wouldn't need dual agency. You would be agent of seller mm -hmm. and selling company transaction, assisting the buyer. Mm -hmm. Be clear on that, because both of them have got the initial here. There are lots of places for them to initial. Now, total price. The listing price on this property is how much? 369.9. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, your buyer has looked at some others around here and he's, he's good with that. He thinks it's a little on the high side because the last one that sold around here sold for 360. Remember you showed it to him. But it was 100 square feet less. He said, what do you think I should offer? Can you advise him on what he should offer? No, very good. You're going to say, since I am dual agency, I can't tell you what their bottom line is. I can't tell them what your top line is. Mm -hmm. I'd rather not know what your top line is. Mm -hmm. What would you like to offer? Mm -hmm. Now, if you were working with your buyer's just your agent and if somebody else is listing, mm -hmm. you're going to say, okay, here's probably what it's going to sell for. What would you like to offer? And they'll say, well, what do you think? Mm -hmm. And you say, well, I would probably, you know, nobody expects you to offer full price. It's just un-American. <laughs> what, what would you like for me to write? Mm -hmm. And they may say, 360. Mm -hmm. So let's just say they told you 360. So we got 360 now. Earnest money. If you're representing the seller, you want to ask for more. You're representing the buyer, you want to offer less. Here, you are uh, representing both. Mm -hmm. I would probably default back to, I would ask you to put at least $1,000 up as earnest money. Mm -hmm. If you put $500 up as earnest money, the seller's going to think you're not serious. Mm -hmm. Well, we had, I think, maybe three buyers just walk away in the last year from $500. Mm -hmm. They just changed their mind. Mm -hmm. You don't want them to change their mind. You want to work this thing on out. Mm -hmm. So I would say at least $1,000 to show that you are serious. And they'll probably say, okay. And now we've got our offer price of $360. And a thousand dollars here. Did that reduce the price of the house by a thousand? No. That no. that confuses people. Mm -hmm. Buyers say, "What happens to that money? Mm -hmm. I'm giving you a thousand dollars here, but it says I still got to pay three hundred and sixty. Mm -hmm. What gives with that?" Mm -hmm. That's when you got to explain to them, which you should have done back in buyer consultation. We talked about earnest money. Here's how it works. Mm -hmm. If you got to explain it again, explain it again. You need to be on the same page. <clears throat> now, how are we going to pay for this? Cash? Well, he's already told you I'm going to get a $350,000 conventional loan, or I can get. Mm -hmm. So it's probably not going to be cash. Mm -hmm. Financing? Yeah, it's going to be a financing. So you're going to click that or either put an X on it. And we know this is going to be conventional, so we're going to put a conventional here. Now, if we have to change this later on because he's decided he doesn't want a conventional, he wants to use his VA uh, eligibility, mm -hmm. um, then we're going to have to come back with what kind of form? An amendment. Okay. And we actually have to have an FHA addendum on top of that too which should have been done when you originally did this but you didn't know he's going to do it then mm -hmm. but once the contract is written and it's an agreement and you have to come back and change anything it's got to be by mutual agreement mm -hmm. and you would have to so we're changing the financing from conventional to VA mm -hmm. maybe other kind of financing maybe the um, the um, the seller's going to uh, Want this? I mean, the buyer's going to want the seller to hold part of the mortgage. Mm -hmm. That's where you would put that in there because that's important. Mm -hmm. That's a term of the sale. And you could have they're going to get a loan in the amount of. You usually, don't put that on there. Just a uh, percentage over here. If it's conventional. Uh, I put eighty percent here. They're going to get eighty percent conventional loan because that's where they're the. Um, mortgage, private mortgage insurance would go away. Mm -hmm. So why would you get a conventional loan for 100%? Mm -hmm. 
where you got to pay all these extra fees. Mm -hmm. So probably going to be 80 percent here. Mm -hmm. You talk to them. You know what kind of loan they're going to get. You can get permission from the um, buyer that will give to the mortgage company that will allow you to talk to the mortgage company. So if y'all have got to work out things, mm -hmm. uh, we talked about financing one night about how you can manipulate numbers, mm -hmm. um, rates, uh, discount points, all that we've already covered. Okay, that's our first page. Wasn't a whole lot going on there, but it's all uh, important. Mm -hmm. So let's review first page. Where do we get the information for this purchase agreement? Church record. We did. Where else? Um, the MLS. Yeah, MLS. We went on there and, and dug up information. Mm -hmm. uh, tax uh, sheet. We got some there. Why is agency the first thing on a sales contract? There is right there. First thing we're gonna talk about. Why is it there? So you know what the duties are. You know who's working for whom. You don't want to get into this thing and the, the buyer say, I thought you were working for me. Mm -hmm. What happens to the earnest money? What happens to it? Got it right here. We got $1,000 worth of earnest money. What happened to it? It goes into a trust account. Goes into a trust account. Mm -hmm. Shows up as a credit right to, to the buyer. The buyer. Page two. This is where our um, finalized date, which is the very bottom of the last page, when we, we are in agreement now with this two-sided bilateral sales contract, purchase agreement, another name for it. Um, that's when these dates start kicking in. The financing back here. It says uh, financing shall apply within seven days. Well, it's actually where that keeps going. Uh, buyer will apply within seven days. Mm -hmm. You may need more than that. It may say, I, I want two weeks because mm -hmm. I haven't talked to a mortgage company yet. And I want to talk to two or three of them before I make an application for one of them. Because mm -hmm. they have different fees. Need to shop. So we got that. Um, financing. Uh, remember we talked about if they change from conventional to VA. Well, that's where this is covered. No terms of the financing can be changed without written authorization of the seller. Mm -hmm. Other things are going on when you change financing. Mm -hmm. FHA, VA, that appraiser, he sees things wrong with the house. He's going to note them on his appraisal, and the appraisal is not valid, and those, well, those things are fixed. Mm -hmm. That may cost the seller more money. So you need to know that. Lender required repairs. Um, and we just talked about that. Um, it may require repairs before that loan can be approved because the appraisal said these things have to be fixed. Mm -hmm. Loan closing costs. This used to be down, not even in the contract. It was just loan closing costs, but now it's loan closing costs and prepaid items. This is real critical here. Seller agrees to pay up to, and we've got different numbers on different types of financing. Number one, the seller can pay up to 3% on uh, a, a conventional loan and pay up to 6% on a FHA loan, VA loan. So you can't put more than that number here. Mm -hmm. Pretty much every buyer is going to ask the seller to pay some closing cost mm -hmm. in addition to uh, half the title and half the attorney. Mm -hmm. They're going to want them to pay more of their closing cost. That's when you'll come up with how much can I ask them for and get away with. Mm -hmm. Well, you're representing both sides here. All you can do is explain how it works. Mm -hmm to the buyer, you can ask for this much. Mm -hmm. They'll say, okay, ask for it. Maybe uh, we got 360000 uh, It's a conventional loan. So 
how much can we ask for? Up to three percent. So what is that? That's about ten thousand dollars worth of closing cost, and uh, three hundred six thousand dollars. He could easily have ten thousand dollars worth of closing cost to it. Mm -hmm. This also addresses prepaid. Let's just say our, we asked for uh, ten thousand in closing costs. We could have written ten thousand here, or we could have said three percent. Okay. Either one. But what this does is says up to. What if your closing cost were only eight thousand, but you still have to pay your homeowner's insurance, also known as hazard insurance, year in advance? Uh, it, that's a prepaid. So you had two thousand dollars left over that you could have applied to your prepaids. So you always want to ask for more or all you think you can get. Mm -hmm. That'll cover maybe part of their uh, okay. hazard insurance. Mm -hmm. So this used to used to, it was being down in the big blank spot. You'd have to spell all this out. They've made it easy for us now. I want ten thousand dollars toward purchase closing costs and prepaids, and that excludes the the title and the attorney. There's still. Um, the seller's going to have to pay that based on what we find another uh, page here. Okay, we got that. Closing and possession date. This is time is of the essence. You want to have enough days in here to get it done. Let's just say uh, it's the middle of the month. You're probably not going to get it closed by the end of this month unless it's a cash deal mm -hmm. you could make it happen I've seen them close in as little as four days it was cash they got right on the title everything's cleared everything's good four days later boom it was done but we got financing in here mm -hmm. finance is going to take a month the AFHA six weeks mm -hmm. so don't put yourself in a corner over here saying well I know you're getting a conventional loan. They're a little faster than FHA, VA, um, but I still would like to have enough cushion in here mm. to where we can get it closed. So it's the middle of this month. Let's shoot for the end of next month as our closing date. Mm -hmm. So you'd put, uh, you know, the, the whatever month, the last working day. Because just the 30 or 30 person may be Saturday or Sunday mm -hmm. or a holiday. So get your calendar out and look mm -hmm. and say, okay, that's what we're shooting for. All this covers uh, possession. Uh, normally possession is at closing. If it's not going to be, address it here. Then everybody signs off on it and then this kicks in. But it also comes back and says, if it doesn't happen, then we can renegotiate. I, real estate closings the seller wants to close the buyer wants to close mm -hmm. if there's an issue it's probably going to be something with title mm -hmm. or the repairs or financing the find the mortgage companies they always want one more piece of paper I just I just need more I need to know I need your bank statements from 2014 okay why why but it just just do what they ask mm -hmm. um, but you may have to come back and say well this didn't get done by this day we need to extend this mm -hmm. for a week two weeks whatever you've got to extend it for well the seller doesn't have another contract laying on the table they've got this one it's good they're happy with it they're gonna get their money and they they know you probably qualified mm -hmm. So they're most likely to say, okay, mm -hmm. and let's move on. Now the finalized date we mentioned earlier, it's on the last page, down at the bottom, that's when these start kicking in. The inspection uh, kicks in. You've got to have it inspected within so many days. Mm -hmm. um, so let's move to our next page, but before we do, let's review this one. Sure, mm -hmm. pay them. You just write in what you want to pay right there. You can't remember your 
your ratios. Do you have a valid contract if you forget to include the closing date? Because that happens more than you would imagine. You're talking about all, you're talking just like we're talking, all the way down through this, and you say, well, let, let's get the calendar out, and then you start talking about this, and you forget about this, next thing you know, you're down here, and you, you miss this. If you forget this, you're still going to have a valid contract because you're just going to call the other person and say, hey, we forgot to put the contract. You, you didn't see it either when you signed it. And they both say, oh, well, when, yeah, the end of next month. Uh, Friday will be the 27th. So, 20, 28th. Friday will be the 28th. Let's shoot for Friday the 28th of next month. And then you'll put, you'll write that in there and then put a little lines out here where both of them will initial because now it's a change in the contract. And everybody's got the initial off on it. Okay? Why is time of the essence so important? Back here, time of the essence. Why is that important? If you miss the, if you miss the dates, then we got a problem. Mm -hmm. Page three. There's a lot to a contract, mm -hmm. but this is where it all is all condensed down into these eleven pages. Every every agreement. There's no side agreements over here. Um, and we already talked about closing a uh, mutual agreement. Uh, Pre-printed are for buyer-seller convenience. They're all negotiable. Everything's negotiable. Even after you have a contract, sometimes you're going to have to come back and negotiate because the inspection came back. And the home inspector said, you know, this HVAC unit's 25 years old. It's got rust all in the combustion chambers. Uh, I think you need to get an HVAC guy to come in and look at it. So you spend another hundred dollars have an HVAC guy come in and he said, this thing is absolutely worn out. The combustion chamber is cracked. You're getting carbon monoxide in the house. As the buyer, are you going to accept that? Probably not. No. You're going you're gonna to come back to the saw and say, the home inspection and the HVAC guy says there's a cracked combustion chamber. This house is not safe to live in. We want it repaired. And you're probably going to say we want it replaced since it's 25 years old. Mm -hmm. You can repair a lot of stuff on one mm -hmm. if it's not that old. But if it's not old, let's just say, I'm Mr. Seller, uh, we need a new HVAC unit. Mm -hmm. And since this was a flip, that's going to give you other clues about this house. They didn't replace a lot of things they should have. Mm -hmm. mm. But that's where it's dealt with. Um, earnest money. Thing, the, we've already covered pretty much everything on earnest money. What it says is it must be delivered within three days of the finalized date. Used to, they sent earnest money along with the contract. Mm -hmm. And you just take the check put it in the safe until we've got a contract and then you put it in the bank. Mm -hmm. Now it says it's got to be delivered within three days of our finalized date. If not, they're in breach. Mm -hmm. Ooh, you don't want to be in breach just because you didn't get the earnest money checked to them. You wanted this house really bad. Mm -hmm. Also it says if the buyer decides to walk away we talked about that back up on why we get a thousand instead of 500 mm -hmm. if the buyer decides to walk away which they do mm -hmm. it says it becomes liquidated damages the seller can just claim it and say you walked away that's my money now mm -hmm. this gives them the right to do it mm -hmm. otherwise we'll have to do a mutual release agreement mm -hmm. probably going to want to do one here anyway but the seller said that's my money Title insurance. This says you're going to uh, supply them with a standard form of title insurance. That's what everybody gets. Mm -hmm. You can get an extended form of title insurance, a little bit more. I've only had a couple people do it. Uh, if I was buying one, I'd say give me the extended. Mm -hmm. That's going to cover 
some unrecorded liens and things that might not have shown up in the title search. It also says right here it's going to be divided equally between the buyer and seller if there is a mortgage. If it's just a cash sale, the seller pays the title insurance policy. Title insurance, we get our uh, closing clo estimated closing cost. We're going to see that title insurance is about six hundred dollars per hundred thousand in coverage. That's just a little rule of thumb. Uh, we've got charts, but um, that's just a rule of thumb for it. Prorations. Prorations, we did that in pre-license on how we divide it up because taxes in Alabama are paid in arrears. Mm -hmm. You've already lived there, now you owe the taxes on it for the time that you were there. So we're going to prorate it up to the day of closing where the seller's going to pay all of that. Mm -hmm. And they're also saying here, the seller's saying, yes, this house is currently subject to class three. That means it's homesteaded. They just added that word in here when they revised this contract. Nobody knew what class three was. Mm -hmm. So they said, oh, we can make that clearer for you. Mm -hmm. um, because if it's not homesteaded, let's just say uh, in your case, the, the flipper has held the house for six or eight months while they were getting it ready, a new tax year has kicked in. Mm -hmm. The old people that lived there, they had it homesteaded. So they were paying taxes at 10% of its assessed value. Mm -hmm. Now the flippers got it and it's started a new tax year. Mm -hmm. They're going to be taxed at 20% of the assessed value. Mm -hmm. And if they click this and say, yeah, it's homesteaded, this is saying you're going to have to pay the difference of that non-homesteaded rate that we're having to pay. Mm -hmm. And that survives the contract as well. All right, what's the contract say about earnest money? You walk away, you lose it. It's got liquidated damages. And who pays for title insurance? Is it split? If there is a mortgage, mm -hmm. and if it's a cash sale, the seller pays it. I say I'm not a review here. Just, you hear this stuff, but it didn't sink in. That's why I'm pulling some of these things out. Page uh, four. We talked about the different types of deeds and pre license. You're going to want, always going to want a general warranty deed. That's the highest form of protection. That means the seller guarantees the title is clear from all defects all the way back to when it was all the way back. Mm -hmm. Then there are less protections under that. This uh, particular case, since uh, the flipper bought it from uh, someone, they'll probably give you a general warranty deed because they've got title protection from the, from the time they bought it, so they know the time, there's another title company that's going to cover it all the way back they didn't hurt the title during the period they had it, the six months or so. So they'll probably say, yeah, general warranty deed's fine. Mm -hmm. Now, if this was a foreclosure, you're not getting a general warranty deed because they're not going to guarantee anything. Mm -hmm. They're just saying, uh, here's, you know, here's what we have. We didn't hurt it while we owned it. Mm -hmm. But we don't know if there was a toxic dump here, you know, six years ago. They don't know. They're just saying, while we had it, we didn't hurt it. Mm -hmm. In this case, we're going to have a general warranty deed, highest level. Hazard insurance, another one of our seven days from our finalized date. You've got to get with your insurance company and say, can I get insurance on this house? Mm -hmm. They do a thing now called Clue Report. I uh, don't remember what that stands for, but it's a database where the insurance company is going to search the history on that house. It may have been hit by lightning, may have had a kitchen fire, mm -hmm. uh, may have had a tree fall on it, mm -hmm. uh, may have had a concrete truck jump off the street and hit it in the front. The insurance company is going to look at that house and say, I just don't know if we want to insure that. Mm -hmm. And they don't have to. 
Mm. They can say, no, we don't want that one. So you're going to have to shop another insurance. You may have to shop two or three insurers coming in. One of them say, yeah, we'll insure it, but here's your rate. And you may say, woo, yeah. didn't expect that. Uh, so that's what this one, this one addresses. If you can't get it, you're not going to get a mortgage on it. Or if you're paying cash, would you want a house with no insurance on it? No. So this addresses that. Here's our Alabama buyer beware. It says buyer's duty to inspect. AIM bolded up some stuff. The real estate broker and agent strongly recommend the use of professionals, but endorse none of them. Remember, we, we don't guarantee any of them. But that's Alabama, buyer beware. You need a home inspection here. It's about four hundred dollars. Money well spent. Mm -hmm. um, down here, condition of the property. This is just getting the monkey off of our backs as agents and brokers, saying, even though I might have said this was the nicest house on the planet, mm -hmm. that's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. It's on you as the buyer to make your own decisions. You're not, this is saying, you, I'm not relying on anything you told me as an agent because all agents are liars. It's just the way you are. I know about you. Mm -hmm. And this is just covering that. This is saying, you don't rely on what the agent told you. Mm -hmm. Get a professional mm -hmm. to tell you. And it goes on and lists all the different things that can be wrong and you're saying, oh, I didn't know there were that many things wrong. Maybe I do need to inspect it after all. Mm -hmm. But from our finalized date, you had seven days to get that inspection done. Mm -hmm. And if you wait two weeks and then call the seller and say, hey, I want to set up an appointment to get it inspected, they say, why? You've already missed your date. Mm -hmm. You can't use that as an out now. That page is a little easier. What's the highest form of the deed protection? General warranty. General warranty. Mm -hmm. Will contract close if property is uninsurable? No. Probably not. Mm -hmm. What does the contract say about inspections? Need inspections. Do it! <laughs> this is Alabama. Buyer beware. Buyer beware. Mm -hmm. Do it. And do the final walkthrough mm -hmm. on your way to closing to make sure it's as you contracted and the seller did all the repairs that you uh, asked them to do and they agreed to do. Mm -hmm. Page five. Um, oh, what are we doing back here? Oh, the, this is more about condition of the property here. Um, just, I mean, this is just telling you, here's, here's the deal on inspections. Now, you've got your choice. Do you want to have an inspection? Sale property is not contingent on an inspection. No repairs requested. It's as is. No warranties. You take it like it is. Mm -hmm. Do you want it like that? No. I've never had anybody take that one. Say, so, no, we're not even going to look at it. Mm -hmm. You're always going to jump down here. Sale is contingent on inspections. Now, here's where our, our uh, finalized date kicks in. Seven is normally what they have. You used to have that written in there. Uh, you can ask for whatever you want. Mm -hmm. You can say, oh, we'll do it um, in 10 days. We may have some other specialized. We, we may, with a septic tank guy, may not can get there within seven days. Mm -hmm. um, it may be the middle of winter and everybody's HVAC uh, uh, systems are, are on the blink. You know, it dropped down to five degrees last night. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be able to get an HVAC guy just to go do an inspection. You may say, okay, you know, the weather, we need some more time for the HVAC guy to get out there. We want uh, 10 days here. Mm -hmm. And if they initial it, then you got 10 days. Request for repairs? All right. Went out there, the HVAC guy looked at it and he said the, uh, the system needs to be replaced. You're going to send that request to the seller and this says they've got three days to respond. 
you may say I'm gonna give them five days or the seller may come back and mark that out and say I want five days mm -hmm. I'm gonna be off on vacation or something that week mm -hmm. uh, lots of reasons that you would change any of these days but there's they're changeable if the uh, I say if uh, if the seller decides no I'm not gonna fix anything or I am this is when it, we're going to give you two more days mm -hmm. to say oh yes or no and then okay well, that was a quick page <laughs> does the seller have to allow an inspection do they have to allow it yes well I don't know that they have to oh, okay uh, but I wouldn't buy one without it. Beware. Yeah. Yeah. If the seller says no, we don't want you going in the house. Mm -hmm. Oh, red flags just bunch of just like Sell it. <laughs> we got we got red flags everywhere. Wait a minute. Yeah. Uh, I'm withdrawing my offer. Mm -hmm. And then say, well, okay, you can you can go in since you withdraw the offer. Mm -hmm. uh, but if they ever tell you that, you you might want to just walk away from this deal right now. Mm -hmm. Can the seller refuse to make repairs? Yeah. Of course they can. Mm -hmm. They do all the time. Mm -hmm. um, you get um, your repairs shouldn't be cosmetic. Mm -hmm. They should be like the HVAC does not function. Yeah, major the toilet is missing in the master bedroom. Mm -hmm. Well, we want a toilet in mm -hmm. here. We want to make sure it all works. Right. There's a reason. Why don't you take the toilet out to begin with? Well, it wouldn't. It, it was all clogged up down in there and we just took it out and put a cap over it okay we want to dig a little deeper on this for sure mm -hmm. but the seller can say no we've lived with it like that for the last 10 years you can learn to live with it too no I'm not mm -hmm. no so what are the buyers option is the seller refuses walk away, walk away. Mm -hmm. or negotiate um, you could get a plumber to come out there and take a look at this and, and he may run the snake down through there mm -hmm. and um, all of a sudden it works mm -hmm. all right well that plumber's on you that's an inspection you're gonna have to pay for okay. but now that gives you information mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with it other than it was clogged up okay. so a new um, toilet's going to be stayed installed, say it's five hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. You'd want to come back and say, okay, um, you don't want to fix it. How about we want five hundred dollars for us to fix it? Mm -hmm. And the seller can say, that's all it was going to cost to get that fixed. I would, I would have done that myself. Mm -hmm. But you don't know what people are thinking. Yeah. But you can. Everything's negotiable. We're going to go, um, I said, you know, we got a little, little while to go for lunch. Page six. Um, ordinary wear and tear. You did your inspection, then you sent the list to the seller, and he fixed some things, and then you do your final walkthrough, and it looks like they had a party in here. Oh my goodness, what what happened to all the walls? What happened to the carpet? Mm -hmm. Well, that's not normal wear and tear. Mm -hmm. Now, if they were moving out and it was raining and now there's some mud on the carpet, uh, that's still going to fall within... This is something that... The, it was not like this when I contracted it. Mm -hmm. I want the carpets cleaned now. And the seller's going to say, we've already moved to Wisconsin. We're not cleaning the carpets. Well, we can have them cleaned for you, and it's going to be $300. Mm -hmm. Because you're doing your final walkthrough, and it's different from what it was when you bought it. Mm -hmm. So you really don't have a contract on it in this condition. Mm -hmm. What about these holes in the wall? Somebody had a party in here, a hearty party. It's going to cost two thousand dollars to resheet rock this room well the seller's probably going to be up against the wall they've already moved to wisconsin they're not coming back moving in this house and fixing it mm -hmm. they're going to say well how much is it going to cost to get it done mm -hmm. because they're not going to be able to sell it to somebody else with it looking like this mm -hmm. 
Additional inspection, this would cover things like uh, the inspector said the roof is not got much life left on it. It's in pretty bad shape. You might want to get a roofing contractor to look at it. Mm -hmm. All right, so you've got a roofing contractor. He came in and looked at it and said, yes, the roof needs replacing. Mm -hmm. Now, the seller can say no, or the seller can say, well, how about we give you 5000 toward the roof replacement? Mm -hmm. Everything is negotiable. Here we got uh, termite. Start a new section here. Your termite inspection is going to be, that, this one should be in front of that one. The termite inspection, every mortgage company is going to require a termite inspection. They want to know the house is not eaten up with termites before they put a mortgage on it. Mm -hmm. So the termite inspector is going to go out there. It's about $150 for them to do a termite inspection. If there's no termite bond on it, then it's going to be about another $250 for them to, well, they bond it now. They used to insure it. It's going to be either at the seller's expense or the buyer's expense. Well, you're working for both sides here. It's going to be a little ethy there to where you say, well, I think the seller should pay that. Or I think you should pay that. Mm -hmm. You're just going to talk it out with them. Uh, the mortgage company requires this. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to have to pay things that benefit you. That's normally the way uh, sh things shake out in a closing is whoever benefits from it pays for it. Mm -hmm. Well, you've got to have this done before you can get a mortgage. Mm -hmm. So that may fall on you. Mm -hmm. But if you can put it over on the seller, great. <laughs> Got to have a new one. Uh, the buyer requires a termite survey. Always, 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 they're going to require a termite. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes they're going to want a wood infestation report as well. This covers more things than just termites. This also, they'll see termites if if they're there, but there'll be other things. Um, mold could be destroying the wood. It could be. Um, what are those things called? Carpenter ants. Mm -hmm. They're eating the wood. There may be um, pine beetles. There could be a lot of different animals or critters or things besides termites. Mm -hmm. And you may want that. That'll be the same person that does this one does this one. You've got to be licensed as a termite person to be able to do this one. This inspection has to be done within 10 days of the closing. You got the contract today, you know it's going to close in six weeks. You don't order the termite today. Mm -hmm. Because if you do, you're going to have to order another one, mm -hmm. which is another $150. So just you can go ahead and call because the seller should have a termite contract on it now. Mm -hmm. Find out who it's with. And a lot of times that company will come on out there uh, for free because they want to keep you as a customer. Mm -hmm. Some of them don't. But you can go ahead and get a hold of them and say, okay, we're going to have a closing on the 28th of this month. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, okay, we'll put it on the calendar uh, for 10 days prior to that. Mm -hmm. So they'll get out there, do it, send the report. The report and the bill goes to the closing agent. Even though you ordered it mm -hmm. as an agent, mm -hmm. uh, it's going to, you don't, those, these costs don't fall on you as an agent. Mm -hmm. That you'll, They'll say, who's the closing agent? Mm -hmm. And you'll say, and say, okay, yeah, we got all their contact information because they do this all the time. Mm -hmm. But 10 days prior to closing, that's got to be done. Sewer, septic tank. We talked about that already. If it has a septic tank, I want it cleaned out and inspected. If it's got a sewer, and you know that they've had issues, they tell you just you just accidentally, they said, yeah, every now and then the sewer clog up. Uh-oh. Well, it's on a sewer pipe going, there shouldn't be anything between the toilet and the sewer line in the middle of the street that's causing this issue. Mm -hmm. So, 
I might want a sewer inspection. That's on the buyer too, to have that done. My house, when it was built, the sewer line goes out through the backyard down to the sewer, main sewer line, but they planted a little tree, a little tree about that big when they moved in, right on top of the sewer line. That tree now is this big around. And I'm betting the sewer line is probably not 12 feet deep. It's probably just a foot or two under the surface. Mm. Well, this big monster tree, pretty heavy, I'm guessing. Wow. Maybe bending down on this line, causing a little spot right there. Mm -hmm. Also, when my house was built, they were using terracotta pipes. That's mm -hmm. a, an old clay type pipe, and they just hooked together. Mm -hmm. All right, well, where they hooked together, there was a, some, a, a, something in there at one time, mm -hmm. but my house was built in 55. Mm -hmm. This big tree has roots mm -hmm. growing in there, and about every three years, we have to get uh, one of those sewer auger things, because mm -hmm. it'll get to where it won't flush. Yeah. And they'll come out and they'll run that thing down through there, and he'll pull out a you know, bucket full of roots. Mm -hmm. Okay, if I know that, I want this done now before we move in. Make sure everything's working. Mm -hmm. Make sure this tree has not crushed. Mm -hmm. I have them run a little camera through there. Mm -hmm. They can do that and say, well, whoa, whoa, everything's broken up down here. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to have this. It's going to be $3,500 put a new line. Well, if we, we know that now, mm -hmm. we're better off than finding out a week after we move in mm -hmm. and the toilet won't flush. So, what's the wood infestation report? It's similar to the termite Yes, yeah, similar. Uh, looking for anything else that may be hurting the wood. Mm -hmm. And who pays for it? No. Is it the buyer? The buyer's going to pay for it. The buyer's going to pay for all the inspections. Okay. Anything that benefits you, you pay for it. What's the difference in, the, in a septic and a sewer system? Well, you have to clean out the septic. It's a it's, tank mm -hmm, yeah. that stores all this mm -hmm, the waste. stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's got little things called field lines that go out from it. Mm -hmm. And as it fills up, all this water and stuff goes out in these field lines. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't go anywhere else. It stays in your yard. Mm -hmm. Where a, sep a sewer system is going to be a pipe that goes from your toilet mm -hmm. straight to the sewer line. There shouldn't be anything in between there. Mm -hmm. That's with the city, right? That's going to be in the city. Okay. Mm -hmm. But there are places within cities that you would think they've got septic, I mean sewer. Mm -hmm. uh, well, this particular property we're dealing with is on the top of the mountain in Vestavia. Vestavia you can pretty much go anywhere in Vestavia and see rocks. Mm -hmm. You've seen them. Mm -hmm. out the front, all these, why you got all these rocks in your front yard? Mm -hmm. Well, it's because there's only that much topsoil on top of these rocks. Mm -hmm. Not likely you got a septic tank there. Mm -hmm. I mean, or I mean, uh, likely having a sewer there mm -hmm. because they'd have to go in and blast rocks everywhere it puts the system in. Mm -hmm. So you're more likely, a lot of these older places up on top of this mountain have septic tanks mm -hmm. because they just didn't have sewer systems then. Mm -hmm. You get out into the country, you're more likely to have a septic system. Mm -hmm. Some communities, um, they'll bring in a new home community and the city system can't handle it they'll have to build their own private sewer system. Mm -hmm. Page seven. This is talking about surveys. It's, I'm gonna say no more than 10% of the buyers ask for a survey. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they'll ask the seller, do you have an old survey? Mm -hmm. Well, you may be able to give it to them, may not. 
the rules on copywriting stuff that you can't give it away. I don't know how all that works. <laughs> if you really want a survey, hire a surveyor. Mm -hmm. We've got uh, one we're going to talk about here in a minute. Uh, but you have them come out and they'll survey it all for you. Cost about $400 on just a regular size house. And this is something that's going to benefit the buyer and the seller. The buyer. So who's going to pay for it? The buyer. See how this works? You play, you pay. Um, and we're talking about floodplain. Mm -hmm. We found that on our tax stuff mm -hmm. that we looked at. It says outside the one or uh, 100 year or 500 year floodplain. Mm -hmm. This one was outside it. Mm -hmm. uh, this house, where it is, if it floods there, uh, you're likely to see Noah go by in his ark. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the top of the, it's the highest point around here. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything within 10 counties will be flooded yeah. before this place floods. Mm -hmm. um, so this one's not likely, but some of them are. Mm -hmm. And um, you can actually go on EPA's website, like we did in pre-license, mm -hmm. and pull the map up. And you can see where the flood zone is, how close it is to you. Okay, all inspections, responsibility to the buyer, including the payment for these inspections. Mm -hmm. Now, different from our termite inspection, those people will send the bill to the closing agent mm -hmm. and they will pay the termite company. The home inspector or any of these other surveyors, mm -hmm. those kind of inspections, they're going to want their money today. Mm -hmm. The loan, when you do an application for the loan, they're going to collect some money from you up front, maybe a thousand dollars to cover things that they've got to do, like the, the credit report. And mm -hmm. if they have to, the appraiser, they're going to pay him. Uh, he, he's wanting his money now. He doesn't want to wait and maybe it'll close in six weeks and I'll get paid. Mm -hmm. No, uh, I'm doing the appraisals this week at the end of the week. Uh, he sends them a bill. And he expects his check, mm -hmm. but the mortgage company has already got some money from you up front mm -hmm. to pay for that. Mm -hmm. But pretty much anything that you order, uh, the buyer is going to have to pay for. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to get into some of this other stuff. Uh, the contract used to end about right here. Mm -hmm. And last year they came back and reworked it and brought in all of this stuff like hazardous drywall. Mm -hmm. We talked about the Chinese drywall and pre-license. Mm -hmm. um, there are some areas that we know it's there. Mm -hmm. Some communities that were built, uh, when we, they say it goes back to the year 2000. They didn't really have any before that. But Katrina hit uh, New Orleans in I think, uh, what, 05, 06, somewhere along in there. Mm -hmm. That's when it really came in because there wasn't enough sheetrock to mm -hmm. rebuild New Orleans and meet the demand in other places. Mm -hmm. So here builders couldn't get sheetrock, so they started working to get some. Mm -hmm. uh, and they ended up with some of this Chinese drywall. Mm -hmm. um, they're clues to, you can smell, it like, smells like eggs, rotten eggs, mm. now that's the sulfur in it, mm. but you may not smell it. Yeah. You've got to have somebody that knows what they're doing to check for that. But if you suspect it's got Chinese drywall in it, you need to get it checked. Mm -hmm. Lead-based paint, we've already beat that one to death too many times. Mm -hmm. Subdivisions, regulations, that's your CC and R's. Mm -hmm. uh, you got to get this to the buyer before they go to contract. Because mm -hmm. you don't want to go to contract and then give them the CC and R and say, oh, oh, you can't park an RV in the driveway. Mm -hmm. Well, wait a minute, that's why I bought here, is I, I need to park my RV here at my house. Mm -hmm. So you got to get this to them prior to them going under contract. Okay. School zones, it's all, all this is new down through here, school zones. At the beginning of the session, I said that's why people, that's the number one reason people pick a location is because of the school zones. And these things change mm -hmm. all the time. Rezoning. Rezoning, they they've got now they got too many people in this area for these schools. Mm -hmm. 
You know, they've got they brought in portable classrooms for the last three or four or five years. Mm -hmm. Now you can't even see the school for all the portable classrooms. So they build a new school, mm -hmm. and it's going to change the zoning. Mm -hmm. Well, it may still be the same city, mm -hmm. but now it's a different school. Well, you wanted your kids to go to this. That's where I went to school was that one. I want you to go to that one. That's why we bought this house. Mm -hmm. This is important. Mm -hmm. Who pays for the survey? The buyer. The buyer. See, you getting this? It's, uh, yeah, I see why. <laughs> why is it important to know if the property's in a floodplain? Mm -hmm. So you want to be flooded out. <laughs> You also, you'll have to buy flood insurance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it's about the same price as the homeowner's insurance. Because mm -hmm. it's really insured by the same stuff now. Mm -hmm. The house and the contents. Mm -hmm. Why would lead-based paint be of importance to a buyer of small children? Oh my goodness, I see your eyes getting big. Whoa, yes. It's definitely important with small children. They get it in their brains mm -hmm. and all their organs actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's there forever. Yeah. It doesn't just get on out. Mm -hmm. Who's responsible for obtaining information on the HOA rules? Is it about it? Is it about it? Well, oh. as the listing agent, okay. you would have told the, well, this house doesn't have uh, HOAs. Well, let's say it does. As a mm -hmm. listing agent, you would have, with your consultation with them, said, mm -hmm. I need the uh, CCNRs, any kind of uh, homeowner restrictions. I need to know who the management company is, how much the, uh, the fees are, how often they are. You would gather that up as, as the listing agent. Mm -hmm. And then the buyer's agent would say, I need the CCNRs. Mm -hmm. And you'd get it on to them. Okay. The seller, I mean, the buyer, they don't know. Mm -hmm. They don't even know what an HO is. That's true. Uh, the HO? Right. What's that? That's a little <laughs> tiny railroad train, isn't it? <laughs> they don't know. You're their agent. You're supposed to be advising them. Advising them. Now, page eight. Smoke and fire detectors. Um, this is another thing. Do you think the buyer would want to know if the smoke and fire detectors work? I think so. Yes. <laughs> uh, the home inspector, I'm not sure if he checks those or not. Mm -hmm. Don't know. But I do know that they start turning yellow mm -hmm. and that means they're, they're old and need to be replaced. Mm -hmm. Punching the button on it doesn't tell you if it's working. Mm -hmm. That only tells you the battery's good. Mm -hmm. Most of them now are wired into the system so the battery's just a backup. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can buy fake smoke or just get a, I don't know, a cigarette or something and a match or something and test it. Mm -hmm. But just mashing that button doesn't mean it's working. Mm -hmm. And you got different kinds of detectors. This one's a smoke. Uh, the gas is called a, what's that, a carbon monoxide detector. Mm -hmm. They got combination units, but if you've got a gas furnace, a gas hot water heater, you got anything in the house that's on gas, mm -hmm. I really want a gas detector because you'd be sleeping at night and not wake up because the carbon monoxide. Your appliances like the HVAC, I mean the, the furnace, uh, the water heater, they've got a safety on them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called a uh, thermocoupler. Mm -hmm. That this little thermocoupler, if it's not hot, then it'll shut the system off mm -hmm. and gas won't come through. It's like if you had a windstorm or something and blew the pilot light out in your water heater. Well, the water heater knows that it's been blown out and it'll shut the gas off. And a lot of times when you first just sidetrack off contracts, but I'm going to go ahead and talk about it because this is such a problem. When the first cold snap comes through, a lot of people's pilot lights have gone out over the last six months for some reason because it's just a little bitty tiny flame doesn't take a lot of wind mm -hmm. to blow it out mm -hmm. well it's now out and you turn the heater on in the house nothing happens mm -hmm. you say oh no what's wrong mm -hmm. well a lot of people know how to 
and then the little directions on there on how to light them. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's the first thing you need to check if your HVAC is not, your heating, your furnace is not working, the first cold snap, check the pilot light. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are automatic to where it, it'll turn itself on. Mm -hmm. Got a little clicker thing in there and it'll, it'll turn itself on, but the older ones are not that way. Mm -hmm. All right, a little sidetrack there. Home warranty. Home warranty, we're going to talk about a little later. Home warranty covers systems in the house that break down. Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't cover all of them. We're going to see which ones it does and doesn't cover. But what we're dealing with here is our contract and who's going to pay for it. Mm -hmm. It says a buyer does or does not require a home warranty. If you are representing the buyer, you always check does require a home warranty because that gives your buyers just a little cushion, mm -hmm. a little peace of mind that mm -hmm. things are not going to be bad wrong in here that we can't get fixed. Mm -hmm. And then you always want to put at seller's expense. They cost, uh, let's just say about $650 right now. Mm -hmm. So you put uh, not to exceed, you may want to put 700 there. Mm -hmm. Just in case prices have gone up since you knew they were 650 um, and then that's going to be $700 now that's a negotiating token. Mm -hmm. When we get down to the nitty gritty on this, is that may be something that you can give up. Mm -hmm. And since this house that we're dealing with here has just been rehabbed and you think they've replaced the HVAC system, the, the, the water heater, um, mm -hmm. you, you feel confident that yeah, we could get by without that warranty. Mm -hmm. Seller warrants. This is a saying that the seller has not been notified by the city or any other authority that something's going to be happening around here that um, is going to affect the value of this property. Mm -hmm. Let's just say you live um, um, in an area where they're fixing to build a new prison. Mm -hmm. And the seller got a notice from the state or the county that uh, they've been approved, all the plans have been done, the permits have been done, and there's going to be a new prison opening up just right across the street from your house. <laughs> this is saying the seller doesn't know anything about that. Mm -hmm. Final walkthrough. We've talked about this one. Bottom line is the bottom line here. After closing, all conditions of the property are the responsibility of the buyer mm. unless we've addressed it elsewhere in this contract. That's, we've already talked about this enough. Mm -hmm. Buyer and seller acknowledgement that they have not relied on us to give them advice on mold or mm -hmm. um, anything like that. They, we, we don't know. That's why I say hire a home inspector. Hey, a little recap. Who's responsible for paying a mechanic's lien if the seller doesn't tell the buyer about it? The buyer? No. No? The seller warrants have not received any notification from any authority or any alterations, okay. property that have not been satisfactorily made, no unpaid indebtedness. There's a warranting that. The warrant means I promise. Mm -hmm. Here they, oh, I forgot to tell you, I put a new roof on it last year and didn't pay the guy, didn't pay Lowe's, either one. They both sued me, they won. Now we owe $10,000. Mm -hmm. They didn't tell you about it. What if the lien had not been recorded? Well, they still didn't tell you about it. Mm -hmm. They're still going to fall back on them. But had it not been recorded, this is where we would want that extended title policy. Oh, okay. That would cover it. What if after closing the buyer discovers a water heater doesn't work? Mm -hmm. that after closing, okay. um, all conditions of the property are the responsibility of the buyer. Okay. You did a walkthrough on your way to closing. Did you check the water heater? 
Eh, probably not. Did you even turn the water on and see if it's working? No, probably not. Um, if it's not working after closing, it's on the buyer. What if mold in the basement that was found to be toxic after agents said it was probably just mildew? No, I think it's right here. Mm -hmm. Buyer and seller acknowledged and agree that they have not relied upon any advice or representation of the listing broker, company, or selling broker of the company. Mm -hmm. They're probably going to sue you. But then you're going to say, what did the contract say? Mm -hmm. The contract says, don't rely on anything I told you. <laughs> That's what that's saying. Mm -hmm. Mm. This is the first deal I've ever done. Looks like, smells like, looks like it. Mm -hmm. We had some mildew once. That's probably what it is. Mm -hmm. You're just trying to make the sale, running your mouth. Mm -hmm. But this kind of gets you off the hook. Mm -hmm. But they'll probably sue you anyway. But then your attorney's going to tell their attorney what did the contract did say? The contract say. Mm -hmm. Page nine. Risk of loss. The seller is going to keep insurance on the house up through the day of closing. Mm -hmm. Your insurance kicks in then, but his is, his is uh, covering the house and everything until then. Okay. Now, if it burns down prior and you've gone under contract and then the house burns down, mm -hmm. the seller's insurance is going to come in and re re bring it back up to where it was when you bought it. Now, if they don't, then they're in breach. Mm -hmm. You could sue them, and I don't know what you'd get, but uh, mm -hmm. they would be in breach at that point. Mm -hmm. The deal is, they're supposed to keep it insured mm -hmm. to bring it, um, what's it called, make you whole again. Okay. You know about insurance. Mm -hmm. You saw homeowner's insurance? No, we do homeowner's. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, homeowner's insurance makes you whole again. Okay. You're not going to make money on it. You're not going to get all new everything mm -hmm. and upgrade. Um, but if it did burn down, now the buyer's got a choice. Mm -hmm. It's not like it was when they bought it. Mm -hmm. They can say, no, this is, this is not what we bought. Yeah. Um, or they can say, okay, I'll take it just like this and give me the insurance proceeds. Mm -hmm. They've got that choice. Every property is unique. Mm -hmm. It may have been the location you were wanting. Mm -hmm. You want to tear the house down anyway. Mm -hmm. You don't know what's going on in the background. Mm -hmm. Selection of the attorney. Um, pretty much every contract is going to say they do agree to split the closing uh, attorney fee. Mm -hmm. Now, the closing attorney does not work for the buyer or the seller. They work for the mortgage company. Mm -hmm. They will answer general questions to you about this transaction related to the mortgage and all that, but they're not going to give you any legal advice. That's not why they're there. If you need legal advice, you bring your own attorney in there. Mm -hmm. Have them sit right right there with you and they can ask questions. Mm -hmm. They know which questions to ask. Mm -hmm. I've only, and I don't know how many years I've been doing this, but I've only had one time when the buyer brought an attorney. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of funny. It was, he sat there and didn't say a thing the entire time. And I thought, I wonder what he got paid for that. Hmm. Personal property, if you, uh, we've got a personal property addendum here that says, here are the things that are going to be left with the house. We're agreeing on this. We're going to leave the window treatments. We're going to leave the bathroom mirrors. Why do you have to put that in there? That's because someone somewhere took the bathroom mirrors with them. Hmm. So now it's written into the contract. But all this personal property is going to be as is mm -hmm. at no value because the appraiser gets this contract and if it says okay um, we're gonna uh, leave the all the the media room and ten thousand dollars worth of equipment in here well the appraiser is 
going to say, okay, well, that's $10,000 worth of value mm -hmm. unless you put it as no value, which now is in the contract as no as is at no value. So the appraiser doesn't look at that as an addition to the house. Mm -hmm. Other offers. All right, this is a real popular area, really nice house, and it's priced right. You may get two or three offers on it that first week. Mm -hmm. Now, if you do, the seller has the right to look at them and think about it. The buyer may put a time on there that we want to answer by uh, 5 o'clock tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And I see that on popular properties. They're trying to push you. Mm -hmm. They don't want anybody else to slip in there under them and get that deal. Mm -hmm. So they'll put a time limit on it. But the, the seller can keep looking at these offers as they come in and then say, oh my goodness, we've got three really good offers here. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times that will boil down to the financing. One of them's paying cash, mm -hmm. one of them's getting a 80% conventional, and one of them's getting 100% VA. Which of those do you think's got the best chance of closing? The cash. Oh, the cash, yeah, okay. Yeah, the cash, they don't have to do anything. They just bring the checkbook. Mm -hmm. Well, now everything's wired in now, but mm -hmm. uh, that may be what determines the seller's, it may be a lower offer. Mm -hmm. But he knows I can close this in four weeks and be gone from here, got my money, no problems are going to come up. Mm -hmm. Or one of them, um, um, there may be another one over here that may be a little lower and it's as is. Mm -hmm. They're not even going to do an inspection. So I says, really? Mm -hmm. I'm going to take that one mm -hmm. because I know about all the bad things in here. I know about the the mole and the mildew and mm -hmm. the roof leak and you may take that one but they've got that option mm -hmm. to until they go two-sided bilateral with one of those contracts mm -hmm. they're all open we talked about multiple offers mm -hmm. to where you won't just counter them all back at full price mm -hmm. and send them all back because they may all accept your counter and now you sold it three times. Mm. What happens after closing if there's a crash in the housing prices after the agent told the buyer that prices have gone up 5% every year for the last 10 years and will probably go up at least 10 more years? What's going to happen to you? As the, as the agent? Yeah. Can you predict the future? Oh, no. Is any court going to hold you mm -hmm. liable for predicting the future? Yeah, okay. No. We've got, right now, we're in a weird situation with the economy and housing prices and the stock market. And there are people, just as many people on both sides saying it's never going to end. Mm -hmm. And another side saying it could end today. Mm -hmm. The bubble could pop today. Mm -hmm. But you're in that group that says it'll never end. <laughs> and you tell them, 10 years we've had this. Mm -hmm. It'll go on probably 10 more years. That's just your opinion. Mm -hmm. That's puffing. Mm -hmm. They can't hold you to that. Yeah, okay. Must a buyer accept a property in current condition if there was a major fire a week before closing? No. No. Mm -hmm. so it's not like I bought it mm -hmm. or contracted. Who pays the closing agent? Who pays the closing agent? Mm -hmm. Alabama's an attorney. Mm -hmm. Selection of closing agent. Buyer and seller hereby agreed that the closing of this transaction be conducted by a closing attorney or title insurance company and buyer and seller do or do not agree to equally share. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be any contract as to who's paying. Mm -hmm. On this one, when we were talking earlier, we were going to say, uh, yes, we do agree to share, but then back up there, we wanted the seller to pay $10,000 worth of buyer's closing costs, which is going to cover their side of this. Mm -hmm. okay. 
Oh my goodness, we're on page 10. We're almost through with the contract. <laughs> this is something that uh, I remember when fax machine was big technology. I mean, we, we actually printed off by accident the other day our fax log. In the last year, we've got seven faxes. Mm -hmm. We don't get anything by fax. Yes. We, it's all going to be email Thanks. or DocuSign. That's the future. And DocuSign, electronic signatures, have the same weight as a wet signature, they call it. Mm -hmm. Obligation fees and expenses. This says, all right, well, you ordered a survey, you ordered a home inspection, you ordered um, um, septic uh, clean. The seller said they're not paying to get it cleaned out. So mm -hmm. you went ahead and ordered to have it cleaned out and checked. Mm -hmm. And then it doesn't close for some reason or another. Say uh, there's something wrong with your financing. Mm -hmm. And it can't close because of you. Mm -hmm. Who's responsible for all those things that have been paid for? The you are the buyer yes mm -hmm. now I believe if it turned out to be that seller's fault the seller couldn't get clear title mm -hmm. then you may have grounds to come back to them and say hey all you had to do is give me clear title and I spent all this money mm -hmm. uh, but the kind of deal on suing somebody if you're suing them for under five thousand dollars you're wasting your time mm -hmm. The attorney's going to cost you a thousand. Yeah. And then all you're going to get is a judgment. Mm -hmm. Who's going to collect it? How long is it going to take? Yeah. Judgments are not worth the paper they're printed on. All right, additional provisions. See that addendum? Mm -hmm. Remember from pre license, that's what's added at the time of the contract. Mm -hmm. We may have an addendum down here, additional provisions. Uh, seller to leave pontoon boat mm -hmm. or seller to leave lawn tractor. Mm -hmm. You just write that in there. You don't really have to go into a lot of detail. It just you may say seller to leave green John Deere mm -hmm. okay. tractor, mm -hmm. not the old one that's, that quit working 10 years ago and he bought this new one. Mm -hmm. Still got the old one out there behind the barn. Mm -hmm. So it kind of be specific. Mm -hmm. The green John Deere lawn tractor, 42 inch or something. Mm -hmm. Maybe side by side uh, stainless steel refrigerator, mm -hmm. Maytag or whatever model, because there may be an old green avocado one down in the bottom mm -hmm. in the basement that they replaced. Well, that's the one they're going to leave if you just say uh, refrigerator to remain. Wow. Specific. The specific. And this says this is the entire agreement. There are no side agreements. You don't have any any uh, side agreements with the real estate broker, the agents, anybody else, mm -hmm. unless it is incorporated and in, uh, noted in this contract. Mm -hmm. We have a side agreement that uh, sellers to hold the uh, second mortgage, mm -hmm. that you purchase money mortgage. Uh, you'd want to address something like that in here. Okay, that's the page 10. You could add some things here. Uh, we're going to see what we can add in just a second. But who pays the agent? Who pays the agent? Whoever he has agency with. That's right. Who, who, who's going to pay you? If I'm listing for the seller, then the seller pays me. You've got a listing agreement that says the seller's going to pay you. Mm -hmm. We got another one on this one. Mm -hmm. We got a buyer's agency agreement okay. too. So do we. Your buyer may be paying you additional mm -hmm. to what the seller was paying you. Okay. Can you as an agent give the buyer two thousand dollars to help them with their down payment? The agent? Yeah. Can you do that? No. Yes, you can. You can. You can, but it's got to be disclosed. Okay. The lender especially has got to know. Okay. It may knock out their ratios and they can't qualify for the loan if that $2,000 wasn't there. Uh, but yeah, you can do it. Mm -hmm. But it's got to be done at or before closing. Mm -hmm. You can't get your commission check 
and then next day write the buyer a check for two thousand mm -hmm. dollars that's where you get into rebates kickbacks mm -hmm. but if everybody knows mm -hmm. it's okay mm -hmm. we talked about this with the uh, can you pay the seller to do business with you mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. you can give them a cruise you can do whatever you can afford to do does a broker need to sign the contract yeah no you know, that's one thing we have not talked about and you knew that answer right away. <laughs> Can you as an agent sign for your buyer? Sign for your buyer. If you have power of attorney? If you have power of attorney, you can. Otherwise, no, or you can't initial for them either. Mm -hmm. And you'll have that every now and then. You, you're talking about, well, we're, all, we're not going to change anything but the price. We're going to go up a thousand dollars. Can you just go ahead and initial that for yeah. me? No, I cannot. And there's our the last of it. This is um, our finalized date. We started our negotiations a week ago. Mm -hmm. Now we finally got a, an agreement, two-sided meeting of the minds, mm -hmm. bilateral contract. Mm -hmm. And that's today. Mm -hmm. And then you've got here... Uh, you sign it saying okay here's here's when the clock starts on our inspection our financing our insurance this is the earnest money who's got it how'd you get it uh, I don't ever remember getting cash as an earnest money uh, checks and I have had them write a check for earnest money and then change their mind stop payment on the check <laughs> okay it's a funny little business that completes our contract so when does the clock start for inspections once you go yeah the finalized, finalized day, day. Mm -hmm. is an agent responsible for closing cost if the buyer backs out no no mm -hmm. <laughs> just because you ordered the termite uh, termite companies eat those expenses all the time. Mm -hmm. They do these inspections, but see, they're looking for the long-term payoff. Yeah, okay. um, mm -hmm. But um, you're not going to have to pay that. Uh, survey, that kind of stuff, the appraisal, uh, the buyer is going to order that mm -hmm. and pay for it. What will damages be if the, buy the buyer backs out? We had a word for this, liquidated, liquidated damages. damages. Mm -hmm. And that is going to be probably limited to the earnest money deposit. Mm -hmm. Will agents still get paid if the sale does not close? Oh, so sad. No. Did all that work? <laughs> did all say that it. work. Oh, no. And it happens. I've been on the way to closing and got a call. And they said, we're not closing. Wow. That's disappointing. Now, wait a minute. I've already spent my commission. I've already written checks on it. No. We got to close. Yeah. Wow. These are, um, we had these couple of big spaces here, mm -hmm. here, and here. Mm -hmm. Well, this is what you might want to put in there. Okay. You got an addendum form. That's at the time of the contract. Uh, we talked about if you're buying or selling and you have an interest in the property, mm -hmm. uh, backup contract, one or two, um, break clause. This is if they're, uh, the buyer, your buyer, has another house they've got to sell before they can close on this one. Mm -hmm. You would have, that's a contingency, mm -hmm. and you would have a break clause in there. Uh, I like 48 hours mm -hmm. here that says, okay, um, we've got another offer on this house. Mm -hmm. Yours is contingent on you selling your house. Mm -hmm. You've got 48 hours to either remove that contingency. Some of them can. Mm -hmm. Some of them can write you a check for the house. Mm -hmm. Some of them have got to sell that one to get the money to buy this one. Mm -hmm. And if it hadn't sold, then that 48 hours is going to allow the um, seller to move on to the next contract. Mm -hmm. Not getting the earnest money to the seller within three days also allows the seller to
to move on to another contract. Mm -hmm. Bridge loan, um, that's uh, never had one of these, but the buyers got their house for sale mm -hmm. and um, you give them the 48 hour break clause, they say, okay, wait a minute, we've got enough equity in our house mm -hmm. and we've got enough income to where we could make both payments. Mm -hmm. We're gonna draw the equity out of our house to put down on this deal to close it. Mm -hmm. That's what a bridge loan is. Uh, this is a contingency for approval of the spouse or Uncle Henry or mm -hmm. whoever you need to come in there and look at that property. Um, sale of property, that's what we just talked about. Uh, delayed deposit of earnest money. Um, this one, I haven't ever had this, but used to people didn't have electronic banking. Mm -hmm. And they would be in Birmingham to buy a house and all of a sudden they got to have a thousand dollar earnest money check to give to you. Mm -hmm. And they've only got six hundred dollars in their checking account. Mm -hmm. Well, they can't just move money around like we can now. They got to wait till they get back to where they live, right. go to the bank and transfer the money over. So that may, you may have to say, well, don't deposit it until next Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Seller's got to approve it. Sales price escalation clause, we talked about that earlier, about uh, eBay, the way they you can bid up. Uh, that's what that is. Expiration of the counteroffer, if you don't respond within 48 hours, it's, uh, it's no longer an offer. Mm -hmm. um, this is an EFAS. That's a synthetic siding we talked about in pre-license. Mm -hmm. That uh, it's great if it's installed correctly. Mm -hmm. If it's not, then we got big problems. It could be fifty thousand dollars to take it down, and put brick up. Mm -hmm. Ranch farm co-op. Um, oh, this is uh, our uh, uh, what was that called? Implements. Mm -hmm. The seller has corn or something planted mm -hmm. and sells the property. Mm -hmm. uh, this says that they have the right to go back in there even after the sale and harvest their crops. Okay. Now if they do damage, they gotta fix it, but this just gives them the right to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, financing, qualifying buyer with a specific time limit, we should have already had that lined up. Mm -hmm. But this is just probably them needing more time. Mm -hmm. Lot purchase inspection, um, new construction, new construction, Notice by our secondary contract uh, notices. We don't really need all these. Personal property, we've got one of those in a minute. This is where the seller's holding part of the mortgage. But see, you don't write these yourself. Mm -hmm. These were written by attorneys with all their attorney words. Mm -hmm. you know, attorneys used to be called scribes. Mm -hmm. They got paid by the word. That's why all the legalese is so stretched out. It's because originally they got paid per word. Mm. Actually, a little trivia. <laughs> um, redemption, we've talked about that. Uh, you can uh, get around that with a bond or buying out the, other, the seller's right to come back. Mm -hmm. Sinkhole, uh, Shelby County down here, lots of sinkholes. If you've mm -hmm. selling property down there, you need to deal with this. And time is the essence. We've mm -hmm. already talked about that. This is where you just need to write something in. Uh, just a quick little addendum. Uh, I'm gonna say it's, um, um, seller to, to leave uh, pool equipment, uh, pontoon boat, John Deere tractor, all these things that are not written on this next one. This is kind of the standard personal property agreement mm -hmm. to where you're gonna leave these things or not leave them. FHA, VA, if you have FHA or VA financing, you've got to have this addendum in here that says if the property does not appraise for purchase price, you can renegotiate or walk. All right, the rest of this is just some um, links mm -hmm. that cover stuff in more detail that we've already covered. Addenda and addendments. Um, all right, a little review. Why would an agent use one of the above contract clauses? Because I didn't go to law school. 
Okay. Is it a good idea to write your own addendums? No. You, that we just had a whole list of the ones. Here's how they're, here's the wording. Here's how it should be written. Next sheet's the last thing we've got to do. We'd, um, we, we've got the um, seller side. We've also got the buyer side on this one. So we're going to have to do a net sheet for both of them. This just goes over of what you've got to have. We've already talked about this. This is what it looks like. Start out, we've got purchasers, and there's another one like this that says seller. Um, you would have done a seller one when you did the listing to let the seller know here are the costs that are associated with the sale. The buyer, they've got different costs. They're going to have all these lender fees. Seller doesn't have any of that. Third party fees. Remember this one splits, that one splits. These are costs that benefit the buyer. So they're on the buyers. Down here you may have um, uh, credit. Seller credit to buyer's closing cost of $10,000. And then you shake all this out and you come up with a bottom line. This is what you've got to bring to closing. We did one of these in pre-license. This is just kind of a little thing because who's going to order what? You got a listing agent normally and a buyer's agent. And who's going to be ordering what? This lays it out. Listing agent will be responsible for handling all the termite documentation. Oh, we got to do a termite? I didn't know we had to do termite. Well, this is, hey, heads up, you're doing the termite. Or the other one, the selling agent says, okay, you know, we've been dealing with uh, this company all these years you know uh, we know the guy personally he's been over here so many times he eats lunch with us when he's here mm -hmm. we'll call him and tell him to come do it mm -hmm. but the buyer pays the buyer's still paying mm -hmm. but it may be the other side that's actually normally the listing agent's not going to order the termite mm -hmm. but they could it doesn't matter mm -hmm. uh, you, so you'll talk to the other agent you know, well, I do this, you do that, I do this, this, this. That's, that's what you're doing here. This is going to be ordering, the, procuring the surveyor. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is uh, closing services. Mm -hmm. And this one's ordering title services. Mm -hmm. Sometimes these are different. I think it's a good idea to let the attorney pick out the title service. Mm -hmm. He's got a good relationship with title companies. He deals with them all the time. I don't. Mm -hmm. If the problem pops up on the title, the attorney's the one that needs to know about it, not me. So, who's going to order it? Well, thing on the donkey sign, uh, this is what we're moving toward right now. Is everything's electronic. Mm -hmm. This is a cute little buyer letter to the seller. This is in a really, you got a really hot seller's market. Mm -hmm. And there's competition for this house. The buyer sometimes will write a letter to the seller. Tell them how they've fallen in love with the house and they're going to take care of it and their kids are going to go to this school because we went to this school and um, just, you're trying to sell yourself to the buyer. Mm -hmm. I have never had one of these but they say it happens sometimes and, and it may tilt. The seller may bond with them and if they do then they may get that might just give them just the edge to get the deal. Buying your own listing. All these links in PowerPoint mode, you can click on them and it'll take you to that. This is an article by Realtor Magazine that gives you advice. Right, you want to buy your own listing. Whoa. You you get agency with the seller. You already know what their bottom line is. They told you. A lot of times, first time you talk to them, they say, yeah, we, we've got to get 255 That's what our mortgage is. Mm -hmm. We'd love to get closing costs, but we don't have to. We just got to get the mortgage paid. Mm -hmm. And you decide to buy You've already got all this information. You're going to have to get with your broker. Let your broker walk you through this. Mm -hmm. Writing a clear offer, this, just all the way back to the first of this, I said, General Mike Arthur said I want uh, messages that cannot be misunderstood. Don't have anything ambiguous in an offer. 
And there it is. There's an ambiguous offer. Disciplinary action. You don't want to go down to the Alabama Real Estate Commission and stand in front of them and say, I thought I could get away with it. Ooh. <laughs> Deposited funds, we've already talked about earnest money and how it's all got to be deposited, but in this case, uh, you've got both sides, so you're going to get an earnest money check from your buyer, mm -hmm. and you're going to turn it in to your broker as soon as you get it. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean 9 o'clock at night or anything that's going to risk you. Mm -hmm. Agent safety is your first priority. Mm -hmm. um, don't take cash from them either. Uh, because you've got way too many problems with cash. Mm -hmm. You're in more danger with cash. Uh, have them get you a money order mm -hmm. or two money orders or whatever they got to get. Mm -hmm. But um, safely get that to your broker. The next day is fine. The broker can't put it in the bank that night. Mm -hmm. um, Seriously, so, so we had an agent killed here about four or five years ago mm -hmm. taking an earnest money check to her office at night. Mm -hmm. Disbursements of funds. Um, all, all accounts have got to be cleared and all the money has got to be dispersed within seven days. Mm -hmm. FISBO and earnest for sale by owner, that also means fastest source of business opportunity. Mm -hmm. Y'all had an assignment to talk to a FISBO. Mm -hmm. Did you? Mm -hmm. I did. Good. I won't hear about that later mm -hmm. on. Uh, but uh, the rules are the same. You're dealing with a FISBO, you need to give them a recad. Mm -hmm. Uh, here, I'm an agent. Uh, you've got rights and responsibilities. And if there's earnest money with a FISBO, they may not want you to hold it. Mm -hmm. So, who's going to hold it? Just a closing agent. Mm -hmm. Alabama, the closing agent, can hold it just as well as either one of the brokers. Mm -hmm. So, to make them feel better, mm -hmm. you can say, well, we're not going to be holding the money. It's going to be with the attorney that's going to close the deal. And there you say, okay, I just didn't want you holding. <laughs> Exhibits and contracts, these are things like uh, um, you've got a survey, you've got other things, uh, um, uh, HOA docs, uh, um, CCNRs, those are all exhibits. Uh, just some more on exhibits. All right, give me three things you've learned from this session. <clears throat> Buyers beware. Buyer beware state. state. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, the buyer is responsible for everything that benefits them. Good. Mm -hmm. And um, an agent can be have dual agency. They can be the listing agents. Um, they can do the listing and be have agency with the seller. And they yes. can also be. Um, become a dual agency because they represent the buyer as well. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. But they can't, they got to have that fiduciary um, trust and confidentiality between the two. Both, yes. Mm -hmm. Good, <laughs> good. That completes contract writing. <laughs> so we're through with this session. Uh,